Greetings, and welcome to the Thirsty Mage, the podcast more interested in pairing beers than pairing horny medieval teenagers, unless of course we're talking about Drithia or Petra. Yes, we've all put in way too many hours now into Nintendo's latest entry into the long-running tactics-based RPG franchise, and we're ready to untangle the web of mystery that is Fire Emblem Three Houses. As always, I am your host David Lloyd, and tonight we have a new face at the pub. He is the associate editor at Nintendo World Report, and our resident anime expert, Matt Zawadniak. Well, that's me, I suppose. Uh, not, I don't know how much of an anime expert I am right now, though. I haven't watched anything this season, because this season had the audacity to air alongside a Fire Emblem game coming out. Matt, Matt, the fact that you said this season already makes you way more qualified than David or myself. So, Four anime seasons every year. And yeah. honest, honestly, summer season usually sucks, but I've heard this season. This is the, these are the kind of things anime experts say. So, <laughs> Winter season's always the best. The closest thing to Japanese I've been watching is uh, I just finished an episode of uh, Super Sentai Zui Ranger. So I've going, never watched Sentai, so couldn't go, say. Going back to my is, 90s. Uh, roots. David, is that because you were celebrating Power Rangers, National Power Rangers Day or something like that? Was that today? Yeah, <laughs> it's because I've got my kids completely and utterly addicted to Power yeah, Rangers, yeah. so I wanted to go back and see what the originals look like. Mm. So, And also joining us tonight, Nintendo World, Nintendo World Report Reviews Editor and man who likely won't experience the sweet satisfaction of a good night's sleep for at least three more months, Jordan Rudick. <laughs> Well, that I mean that that's the reason I wasn't on our last recording, even though I I had hoped to be and I we had planned for me to be, uh, just because the the kids weren't sleeping. So, um, kind of in that vein though, David, you've kind of set me up for something. I'm I'm gonna surprise you and surprise our audience a little bit here tonight. Um, uh, so I have started drinking a little bit more. <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> you know, having two kids is it's hard, especially you know they're both pretty young too and. Uh, my, my younger, my youngest son is, uh, five weeks, uh, five weeks. Yes. A couple days ago. Um, so yeah, I'm actually drinking, uh, a wine, a white wine. Um, I don't know if we could just hop into the drinks here. I've, I've, I don't know if I, I'm spoiling any segue you might have here, David. <laughs> <laughs> no, this, this is a, one of the rare occasions where you're drinking an alcoholic beverage. So I think you should. Right. So I gotta, I gotta introduce the segment then. <laughs> Uh, yep. so it's a, a Pinot Gris. It's from, uh, Tin Horn Creek, I guess is the, uh, the vineyard. Um, it's an Oak, uh, BC Okanagan Valley wine. Okanagan is a really nice kind of, um, an area where they grow a lot of fruits, uh, peaches, apples, grapes. Um, it's kind of in the, uh, I guess more Eastern or middle part of BC where it's a little bit hotter. Um, and I'll just kind of give you the description on the back here. It's not, it's not bad. I'll talk about the flavor in a second. Um, but uh, according to the back of the wine bottle, uh, located on the Golden Mile, Tinhorn Creek vi- uh, Vineyards overlook the southern Okanagan Valley and a historical mining city, the uh, winery's namesake. Uh, the estate vineyards provide the grapes to craft wines that reflect both place and time. Founded by the Oldfield family, these varietal wines are truly unique. Uh, 100% Pinot Gris fermented in stainless steel barrels and tanks with native and selected yeasts. Uh, flavors of orchard fruit, citrus flower, and uh, sp- uh, spice scents, I think it says. Uh, you can definitely get the orchard fruit, and that kind of makes sense, given that it's from the Okanagan. Uh, it's nice. Uh, it's a little dry for me. I prefer kind of sweeter wines. Um, a- as you might have guessed from uh, all my previous other beverages I bring to the pub. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, I usually go for, uh, Rieslings and things like that, but, um, this one's not bad. I think I will be drinking more wine, not just cause I'm a father of two now, but because, uh, I've kind of discovered that, uh, wine doesn't really upset my stomach. Uh, I know I've mentioned before, David, that, uh, beer is something I can't really drink anymore because it, uh, really, uh, really doesn't agree with me, uh, physically. So, uh, I might be drinking more wine on the pub so people can look forward to that. Cool. Well, that's. Uh, Jordan, I think I think we're gonna have a thirsty pub thir- first, because uh, 
Matt also is drinking an alcohol beverage. <laughs> three for three? No, <laughs> this has got to be a blue moon or something. I, let me check. Yeah, I know. <laughs> what? What can I say? I'm a single man in my 20s. I, t- I guess I drink a lot. <laughs> it's not the, like, 2,000 hours you put in a fire emblem that's forced you to drink here, Matt? <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, no. No, don't okay. worry about that. Although maybe maybe playing it three full times, maybe that that's did a little a bit lot. of it. That's a lot. Eddie, go ahead. Uh, I wouldn't say I have anything special to drink. I'm not very picky. Uh, my go-to is usually uh, a rum and coke. Uh, my my rum tonight is a Cruzan rum. Uh, uh I, that's just some off the shelf thing. I didn't even buy it myself. A friend came over for a movie night to watch Disney's Descendants three, the the conclusion to the epic trilogy. Uh, and he just, you know, I paid for pizza. He paid for the alcohol. So I've got that. Uh, you know, my like I said, my go to normally rum and coke, but I'm branching out a little bit, going with rum and Barks root beer tonight. <laughs> That's, I haven't heard that one. See, I've I've done that before, so. but I found it too sweet because the root beer is really sweet. And if you if you have like a sweeter rum too, that it's a little bit much. But I, I used to drink a lot of rum and coke too. Actually, I'm, I'm a, definitely was a fan of that. I can't really drink it anymore. But the the root beer is definitely a stronger flavor than coke was. But in all honesty, I was just getting sick of coke. Um, I started to kind of get to the point where it's like. I remember once when I was still in college, um, I just had a night drinking with friends. We just stayed in. We drank a lot. We we just sat around, talked, played video games. And the, um, the next morning, we felt really awful, not because we were hung over, but because we there was just so much sugar involved in all that Coke we were mixing in, and we just felt so sick. It's a, it's a tough so thing I've to been... pound back, like, you know, half a dozen of those, if, if that's the way you're trying to get drunk, because you get really bloated, too, from all the sugar. Yeah. Yeah, it's... Uh, <laughs> I, I need to find something that... that <laughs> that i can mix with a good result that's not soda but i'm just i'm i'm so basic still i don't i don't know anything about anything so god i don't know what to do besides just more soda join me on my wine journey here matt you know every every two weeks on the thirsty page i do i do wine for you to try historically i haven't liked wine but now that i really sit down and think about it i've only tried it once so Maybe I should give it another shot. I just need the I right wine. I think there's so many different types, you know, in, inside of red and white wine, the, the, that that kind of basic split. You know, you still have, you have got like blends like rosé and you've got champagne, obviously, uh, bubbly stuff. But yeah, just in, in the whites and the reds, like there's so many different types. I think they taste pretty different too. So you might, you might find something that you like if you look around, uh, look around enough. Yeah, I need to I need to branch out a lot more than I have. I've just been <laughs> rum and coke for like what six? How old, how old am I? Twenty seven? Twenty six? Five years You're, now? We can't tell you that. You you need to have that information ready to go when we Look, record. Once you <laughs> once once you lose your your parents' health insurance because you turned twenty six, you don't care how old you are anymore. Although you you guys neither of you guys are in America, so I don't know how healthcare works for you guys. It we better can turn ourselves here. stupid no matter what age we are. Our, our stomachs will be pumped someone for will, free. Someone will still take care of us. <laughs> yes. Right. <laughs> well, if if you're getting older and looking to branch out, you could always do a rye and coke. That's 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 what I drink with my dad. I, I am well past too, yeah. the age where you care about your age, much like Byleth's father Gerald in Fire Very Emblem good. Three Houses. Okay. Nice, nice. That's right. Well, I'll, uh, I also I'll finish up with the with the final drink of the night uh, the first time again like i said i believe this is the first time in thirsty mage history that we've all had an alcoholic drink and uh, i've been trying to pair my uh, try to keep the themes going when we have a game and because we we spend uh, uh, hours upon hours inside a monastery i decided to go back to belgium for my for my beer and uh, the one i have tonight is called a Merdsu brun it's an 8% dark abbey beer and um it's a, it's a creamy it's a bit of a creamy one it's a dark a dark amber which is my favorite um it actually is is a funny choice for me because um my favorite beer right now is um is uh, uh, a dark is, is it's a double uh amber um that i used to get from my favorite pub and they've actually stopped selling it and now they've replaced mm-hmm. it with this Merid Sue Brun. So it's it's kind of in the same vein, and it's got kind of a caramel taste to it. But um, this this is my my new drink of uh, choice now at, at my favorite pub. So it just worked out perfectly paired with the uh, the monastery uh, hours that we've put in at Fire Emblem Three Houses. 
Well, you kind of got lucky, David, that they replaced what was your favorite or one that you really liked with something that you you seem to like as as much or, or, or more, right? Like, you know, it, it would kind of suck if they take your favorite thing off the menu and they replace it with something you don't really <laughs> care like, for. And you're like, like, oh, well, it's like re- to hell with you guys then. Replacing <laughs> a burger with a fish sandwich. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Uh, but before we get into Fire Emblem Three Houses, uh, I know uh, Jordan and Matt, you both are Fire Emblem fans from previous mm-hmm. previous versions. Uh, maybe if you guys just want to talk a little bit about uh, the history leading up to Three Houses. Uh, I mean, if you wanted to, I could go on a lecture of all sixteen games, tell you tell you what they are, who they star, where the continent they take place in. I've I've done that exact TED talk at least three times. <laughs> Maybe, no. maybe in the interest of keeping this uh, podcast somewhat <laughs> slim, um, maybe it would have just to go over like the games we've played or like some of our favorites, things that stand out to us might work out. Matt, what do you think? Uh, by, yeah, by far. I have played um, almost every game that was released in America and a handful that weren't. Um, the only game that was released in the West that I have not played is Sacred Stones. Um my friends and I were doing a big Fire Emblem binge playthrough every single game a while back, and it kind of ran out of steam around the time that we all went on vacation together and didn't have time to play Fire Emblem during that time. Uh, I'm hoping to get back to it one of these days, but we were right in the middle of Sacred Stones then. Um, but I got my start with Fire Emblem with uh, Path of Radiance. Uh, I bought that in... I, it was it was my first year of high school, and it quickly led to Fire Emblem becoming my favorite Nintendo franchise. Um, this was in 2007. It would have been right before Brawl came out, after Ike was revealed for, for Brawl. Smash Brothers, that is. Um, and uh, I fell in love with it. Um, I believe the Tellius games, Path of Radiance and Radiant Dawn, uh, they are still my favorites in the series. They have an incredible story. Uh, Radiant Dawn, I think, is nearly a perfect game. They ruined support conversations. They, like, threw them in the trash. They were awful. But otherwise, it is... That game was basically everything that I could have wanted out of a Fire Emblem. And I still think, to this day, Path of Radiance is one of the most perfect starting points that you can get to. Because not only is it the first in a two-part series that's incredible, it's also the easiest game in the franchise. It is not only possible to play the entire game in a solo Ike run, it's arguably easier to do that. Uh, and then I somehow didn't really play Fire Emblem very much again until Awakening came out, despite calling it my favorite franchise that entire time. Uh, and then after Awakening, uh, obviously came Fates, uh, which I hated. And then um, after Fates was when I decided, okay, let's play all of them. So, uh, uh, Shadows of Valencia came out somewhere, sometime around then. I absolutely love that game, even if it's held back by some weird decisions from the first, from like the original version. Uh, Shadow Dragon, I think, is antiquated but still solid. Uh, New Mystery of the Emblem, uh, a Japan-only game that was a direct follow-up to Shadow Dragon and a remake of what is considered in Japan to be one of the greatest games in the series. Uh, that game was really good. Uh, Binding Blade, Roy's game. I hated it uh, a lot. Uh, Roy is really bad. Um, the uh, Blazing Blade, the game that came out in America simply as Fire Emblem, that game is solid. And then you know, one of these days I'll get around to Sacred Stones. And that brings us to today. So, I mean, you, you've obviously got a lot more kind of experience playing a variety of the Fire Emblem games. I, 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 I've always really liked this series, but I think I got into it maybe through other kind of turn-based games. Um, I'm thinking of something like uh, Advanced Wars, and I, f- I feel like I played an Advanced Wars-type game on Famicom, or or maybe a, maybe there was a Super Nintendo version or something like that, but um, just that turn-based strategy in general. And then, so the first Fire Emblem game I played was the, the first GBA 1 Fire Emblem. Uh, you said that's uh, Binding Blade, Matt, that is, is that right? That is Blazing Blade. Blazing Blade, um, yeah. It is actually a prequel to, bind- to Binding Blade, funny enough. Gotcha. So I played, I played that one. And I played Sacred Stones as well. Um, I think I most recently played Sacred Stones on, if I'm not mistaken, 3DS because it was one of the 10 GBA Ambassador games. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it was that one. So I, I played that there. Um, I never played the DS game uh, Shadow Dragon. Is that right? Yeah, um, it's 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 tough to go back to. Um, yeah. They didn't... Um, the only thing they really added was the weapon triangle, which actually wasn't in okay. Fire Emblem until the fourth game. Mm-hmm. 
Um, I, I, for whatever reason, I think I only played one of the Wii games, uh, or sorry, one of the, uh, 3D games, the, the GBA or the, uh, I'm getting all confused here, the GameCube one or the Wii one. I'm not sure which one I played. Uh, but the, I mean, when those games came out with those consoles, I was kind of away from Nintendo at the time where I was just playing handheld stuff. Um, uh, Awakening obviously kind of rekindled my interest in the series, you know, really enjoyed that one. Uh, played Fates. I played all three paths of Fates and just, I think I kind of finished it at, because it's, it's, it's okay. Like it's, I, I still like that genre, but I don't think that those were great Fire Emblem games. I think, and I, I think there's a lot of people that would, that would say that. Um, Shadows of Valentia, I really enjoyed actually. I liked that it kind of simplified things a little bit or uh, and added the kind of the dungeon exploring as well. I thought it was a neat, uh, a neat thing to go back to. So um, yeah, not, definitely not as much experience with the series as you, Matt, but definitely one of my favorite ones. And I was really looking to looking forward to Three Houses coming out when it did. Yeah, for me, it's pretty much, uh, I would consider this my first Fire Emblem, really. Like I did mm-hmm. play Awakening on 3ds but if you asked me who was in it what happened i had no idea like i think <laughs> i think chrome might have came in like halfway through the game or something i don't even remember and yeah. i think uh, they thought it was a villain start was he oh, i don't know yeah like i remember nothing from it and uh tactics games in general i think like n- none nothing significant comes to mind pre-switch but mm-hmm. i've played enough tactics games on switch that i've probably played a lifetime of them by now like more than I can actually probably remember. Like we've got uh, Mario Rabbids, Wasteland Two, Fell Seal, Three Houses, Mutineer Zero, Ambition of the Slimes. I think was a tactics game. Like it was, and I know I played others. So it's the my time on the Switch has been an interesting one with with all the tactics based games that I've been playing. But for Fire Emblem, this was my first one, first real one that I remember anyway. Do you have interest in going back to previous ones now, David? Like after your experience with Three Houses, and I think you, you've you've enjoyed it a fair bit. Like, do you are you gonna go back? Do you want to dig through those? Like, especially the GBA games, and maybe the. I mean, I, I know I'm Matt will agree with me here that we're hoping that um, uh, the the uh, GameCube and the Wii games eventually get uh, re released or remastered or something like that. It's kind of kind of sucks that those games haven't been uh, uh, available anywhere else uh, since since they came out, but. Um, yeah, you, Dave, are you planning to go back at all and uh, kind of explore the series more? Uh, not unless they bring it to Switch, I don't think. Like, I can't totally blame you for that. It's it's really difficult to get a hold of like any of the old Fire Emblem games. E- and, you know, there's some of them that still have not come to America in any form. Uh, and actually, Three Houses takes a lot of inspiration from uh, Genealogy of the Holy War, one of those games that has never come to the West in any form. There are a lot of parallels between the two. I want to say that one place, if you were going to go back, I think you can get, I'm going to, I'm going to check this, but I think you can get three of the games on Wii U Virtual Console. I think you can get um, Fire Emblem and Sacred Stone, so the two GBA games that came to the West, and I think Shadow Dragon is also on Wii U Virtual Console. So there's at least three there that I think you could get if you were looking to go back and you've got a, you've got a Wii U, right, David? Yeah. Yeah, and yeah, it's, so you, it's still you, you were looking too, to go back. So. That's probably the that's probably the best way to access those at this point. I think between those three, I would say your best bet is Sacred Stones. Yeah, yeah, I think so too. Yeah. Well, and the other interesting thing to note is that the uh, the Fire Emblem developer has has changed for three houses. Uh, maybe if Matt wants to, he's been you've been working on uh, a Know Your Developer for Intelligent Systems. Yes, that should be coming out fairly soon i just need to grab footage from a bunch of old games and throw it on as some b-roll and then it'll be ready to go so hopefully that'll be done pretty soon um but the officially three houses is still developed by intelligent systems but if you actually look at the credits uh there's literally just seven people from intelligent systems in there everyone else is koei tecmo uh so this is a koei tecmo fire emblem game uh, intelligence systems people were on like the important roles in design. The director was intelligence systems. Uh, the uh, uh, no, the story wasn't intelligence systems. The scenario writers were all from Koei Tecmo, but the director and core game designers they were both from intelligence systems. So it's not like this is a fully different company's Fire Emblem, but intelligence systems was very hands off with this one. 
See, that, that that surprises me a little bit that they were more hands off because it I don't know, it, it seems like they, they've been doing. It, it, has anyone else done a Fire Emblem game outside of them? Like, has, have they ever done something like this before where there's another company that's working on it at the same time and they're they are more hands off? Is this the first time? This is the first time they were even the they're even the primary, not even the primary, but they're the only people doing Fire Emblem Heroes, the mobile game. Uh, and they, they even do the the trading card game Cypher. They uh, they handle the Fire Emblem series entirely of their own. Uh, Warriors was the first thing that someone else did, and evidently they were so impressed with that that they gave a full proper game to Koei Tecmo, but this is really unprecedented, and Intelligence Systems is the kind of company where it's like you have the same teams working on the same games, so it's like, I mean, it's not like these people are working on a Paper Mario game because the Paper Mario people work on Paper Mario. What's What are the Fire Emblem people doing? Hmm. Maybe we're gonna find out in a September direct. I I can only hope. <laughs> maybe maybe yeah. they were making Fire Emblem Echoes uh, Radiant Duology or Fire Emblem mm. Echoes Descent of Jihad. Mm. Which, in case you didn't know, Descent of Jihad was the name that Nintendo Power gave to Genealogy of the Holy War when they ran an article. Is that right? Oh. They ran, oh, they ran an article on like, here's this cool game that's only in Japan. It's called Fire Emblem Descent of Jihad. Yeah, I think they're gonna change that one. <laughs> <laughs> if uh, if it does end up coming here, or coming out at all. Well, with the success of Three Houses, I would have to imagine that they must have uh, something in the pipe. I can only hope. I, I wonder how well Shadows of Valentia sold. Like, if it, if it did well, I think they, they feel like those, those remakes of games are an, an easy path. Like, you've got so many games that uh, you've already made, like already stories and characters and things you've already come up with. So it can't. I imagine it can't take too too long to be able to crank out some of those ones right uh, if i remember correctly shadows of valencia they were satisfied with how it sold mm-hmm. but they didn't brag about it okay. so it can't have it yeah. can't have set the world on fire but it was also very close to the 3ds's uh ending more or less right like there weren't a lot of big games after after that game came out i think that the momentum was maybe slowing down at that yeah point. shadows of valencia was post switch yeah, it was. I think it was May 2017. So you've got all this, all these people that are kind of bought into the new console, and probably a lot of those people have, uh, were 3DS owners too, and, and maybe moved away from that system. You know, especially. Um, I mean, I I went back for it. We we went, Matt. You went back for it, but like I could see a lot of people gonna be like, ah, yeah, I'm kind of done with 3DS. I'm gonna I'm gonna just play games on Switch now. So yeah, uh, I could see how I could see that being one reason why maybe it didn't do as well as it could. It's a big. It, I've never even replayed it for the simple reason that mm. I don't really want to take out my 3DS. I'm done with it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, 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 you're not you're not alone. Well, there might be new players like me who had never played it before who gave Three Houses a a go and would be willing to try another so yeah well shadows of mm-hmm, valencia absolutely. shadows of valencia is a very different game and if you want something that's a totally different speed because mm-hmm. it's a remake of the second game and the second game was like okay let's do all this weird stuff and see where this franchise is gonna go and a lot of the things that they made differently they they pulled back on but shadows of valencia kept all of those weird things it is it is a full-on remake of fire emblem gaiden not of the second fire emblem game it is faithful to that game, sometimes to a fault. And uh, before we move on to the our assessments of uh, Three Houses, I wanted to give Matt a, an opportunity. To, he has some excellent voice acting trivia. I I love me some voice actors. I know a you know I I can just look at some of their names and recognize them. Um, and a lot of them you can just hear their voices and recognize them. There's a hmm. lot of the Persona casts in this game. You've got Tara Platt as Edelgard. She was Mitsuru in Persona 3. Uh, Cassandra Lee Morris is Sothis. She played Morgana in Persona 5. Uh, you have both voices of Igor, the original Igor. Um, oh, God, what's his name? Uh, Daniel Warren. He plays Hanuman. Uh, the new Igor from Persona 5, David Lodge, is Geralt. Uh, Cheremy Lay played Makoto. She is Rhea. Uh, the, list, the list goes on. Um, and you've got other voices... Uh, you've got Robbie Damon playing Hubert. He is the current voice of Tuxedo Mask. Uh, sure. Josie Asia playing Claude was just in Judgment. Lucian Dodge playing Felix. He was in Fate Zero as Waver Velvet. Uh, Allegra Clark is one of those names where I see her name everywhere and I don't actually know who she is, but by God, I recognize it. Uh, Abby Trot, who plays Annette, was uh, the singer for the uh, for the main theme of Super Smash Bros. Ultimate. Uh, oh, Xanth, 
Xanth Hyun as Mary Ann. She was Haru in Persona. Uh, but mm-hmm. by far the most important piece of trivia, Manuela is voiced by Veronica Taylor, the original voice of Ash Ketchum. <laughs> Yeah, I, I remember you, you mentioned that on the Slack chat. I'm like, oh, that that's a really good one. I think people will want to hear about that. So, mm-hmm. And the, and these these are not even half of the actors in this game that I recognize. There are still more. Uh, but, I, but of course, I think special shout-outs are deserved for Mark Witten, the voice of Sedith, when some, me- when some memes came out on Twitter about uh, silly requests from Sedith, such as being trapped in the McDonald's play place and needing help. Mark Witten... <laughs> Turned on a microphone and recorded them. And oh, that's really good. I, yeah, I saw that. I saw that. I saw that image today. I, I need to go find the audio for that. That sounds pretty good. It's it's excellent. He is a hell of a sport. I I know that uh, Claude's voice actor has been kind of all over social media and seems to be you know uh, generating a lot of buzz about the game. Seems to be very excited to be a part of it. Like I, I, I like that he was kind of front and center with the game. You know, talking about it, interacting with fans, and just being like. Hey, like I, I'm, I'm doing this game. You know, hope you like it. How, I want to interact with you guys. I want to talk to you guys about the game. Um, and there's been this huge outpouring of like support for him too. Like, hey, you know, we love, we love what you're doing with this character. Um, yeah, I don't know. I guess this is one game where uh, the voice actors really are front and center, and the it really kind of improves that uh, attachment you get with all the characters. Where, where so much of it is, or if you want it to be is developing relationships with the characters, right? You they actually there's actually letter grades showing your progress with the relationships. So to to make that a better part of the game or make it more immersive, like you want obviously very capable experienced voice actors to bring these characters to life. And I think that I think by and by and large I think that's happened here. Uh, yeah, and I I think personally uh Chris Hackney who plays Dimitri, um if you play the Blue Lions route in this game, he gives one of the best voice acting performances I have ever heard in my life. I I am astonished. Uh, this game, they they spared no expense with the voice acting. And actually, uh, I noticed in the credits, the production studio that they went to for the voice acting is Cup of Tea Productions. They happened to have worked on uh, Fire Emblem Shadows of Lynchia and also Near Automata, two video games mm-hmm. that I have previously said have some of the ve- best voice acting I've ever heard in my life. So Cup of Tea Productions seems to have it right. That well, that that's gonna be a, that's gonna have to be a name to look out for in the future because I I really loved the voice acting in Nier as well. Um, that was definitely one of my favorite games uh, of last was it last year that it came out or when when it came out I I, I played it a little bit later but I really did enjoy that. Uh, so yeah, I'm happy to hear the cup cup of tea you said, yep. Matt. Is that cup right? of tea productions? Cool, right on. Great. Well, uh, why don't we segue into what our initial assessments of Three Houses were? Jordan, do you wanna? Start us off. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Um, so Fire Emblem. So I've only played the one route. I played. I played uh, the uh, Golden Golden Deer. I guess I can't remember anything. But, uh, Golden Deer. Um, it took me about thirty three hours. Uh, really enjoyed the first half of the game before the time skip. Uh, I was really invested in kind of doing everything at the monastery, talking to everybody, um, getting to know all the characters. You know, giving giving flowers, giving gifts, trying to raise all the support levels as much as I could. Um, after the time skip, I kind of got to a place where I was like, I just kind of want to, I just want to get to the end of the game. I just want to see it through. Um, and so I, I, I feel like I did rush that part a lot more. All this effort I spent into tailoring my teammates, uh, I really just used, I really just used Byleth for almost every, I'd say like the last four or five major battles. I, I think I just used him and just kind of ran through the enemies or, or ran straight to the, the captain or the one character I had to defeat in order to win the mission. Um, and he was strong enough that that wasn't, that wasn't an issue. I, I, he was never in danger of dying or anything like that. So, um, I guess one thing that bothered me is that I played on normal and I found that very, very easy. Um, super and easy. maybe, maybe, maybe for a veteran of the series, like, uh, I, I should be putting it on a harder difficulty, but I, I always like to start on normal with games that I play just to see how that is, regardless if I, if I know the series well, or if I'm coming to the first time, I want to see what, what do they consider the normal difficulty? And I think it's far, far too easy 
for um, really anyone with experience in tactics games, especially someone who's played a Fire Emblem game before. I think I think it's far too easy. But um, yeah, overall, pretty happy with the game. Uh, I do have some gripes, which we're going to get into, but um, I'm not I'm not complaining too much. I did enjoy my time with it. So it's it's difficult for me to think back to initial assessments because over the course of almost exactly one month, I put 142 hours into this game. Uh, I played three routes, uh, and my first route was the Black Eagles. I uh, I am a sucker for uh, for representation uh, in video games, and the fact that Edelgard is the first uh, canonically LGBT main character in the franchise was enough for me to choose her unquestionably. Uh, and I was overall very satisfied from from my first playthrough. Um, I I'm kind of like thinking how can i describe my first 62 hour playthrough as initial impressions uh but (laughs) yeah um but right out of the gate i was in love um i was very skeptical of fire emblem three houses in the pre-release phase uh and frankly i didn't think it was going to be very good i i was extremely pessimistic about it until uh around i want to say may some anonymous leaks popped up on Reddit and they were just text leaks of like, here's what the game's going to be. And I read all, I read them and I was like, well, this is too good to be true. This, this is, this is not real. There's no way it's real. And then the E3 trailer hit and it confirmed the leaks were real. And I actually started hyperventilating. I was in the media room of E3 watching this happen. I was like, Oh my God, the leaks are real. This is going to be the best game ever made. And I wouldn't still say it was the best game ever made, but I am, very satisfied. Like I said, I put 142 hours into the game, and while I do have some misgivings about it, they didn't start to bother me until around the 100-hour mark. So, if a game goes that long while still being very good to me, I still think it did something right. And for that for that first weekend, it, I could not stop for anything. I played it 12 hours a day, pretty much, that first weekend. Uh, it was insane. And I even ended up playing it at work a bit. Uh, I took an extra work from home day so that I could get my work done in like two <laughs> hours and then just not work ahead and play Fire Emblem the rest of the day. Uh, unless, unless you are my employer, in which case this is just a funny story that I'm making up. But it's, it's, I, initial impressions were great. I, I loved it. I absolutely loved it. Yeah, for me, um, I think, the word that's kind of summarizes it for me is frustrated. I just felt like I would go through kind of dips and valleys of, oh, I'm having a great time and then hitting something that just made me angry or hitting kind of a, a lull in the gameplay and then getting to a point where it's like, oh, it's getting good again and and then having a whole lot of fun and then hitting it again. It kind of makes me think of like a, a, a four by four relay where like the runner gets way out and then trying then drops the baton when when they're passing it to the next person and then uh you know the runner picks up the baton and makes it pass and then drops it again like that's kind of the feeling that i kept getting was like this this could be a really really amazing game except they do like little things here and there that just suck the wind at you and that's kind of where i got and i i did the golden deer playthrough first and I'm I'm a little over I'm about halfway I guess through um, the Silver Snow I think it's the not it's the Black Eagles but I'm pretty sure I'm gonna end up going with the Church when the the choice comes around and um and it, it it's it's good it's like the Golden Deer I really wish that uh, we'll I guess we'll get into the details later but I really wish it ended with the the battle uh, with the Empire at the end everything after the Empire just completely disappointed me it kind of sucked a lot of the life out of me i can't disagree if it had ended if it had ended at the empire i think i would have been satisfied i would have been like oh yeah there were some missteps but you know it was a good really good game i thought it was great and then and then i run into the, like the night crawlers and then i'm like oh this is just this is garbage <laughs> so so i was really really wish it ended there but uh i'm kind of in the same boat though i put 70 hours 70 80 hours in now and it's like can i really complain about putting 70 80 hours into a game (laughs) like (laughs) but it's more just frustrated that it's that 
it could have been better, I guess, is, is my thing. Like, I just feel like a few missteps took this from a, an incredible game to just a, a good or great game, you know? Yeah, I, I will say um, uh, I played the I played the, the main three routes and it I did feel that Golden Deer was my least favorite, although I must admit a lot of that came from it was my third route and I had started to see the cracks by then. So I I don't know how much of that was just it was because I played it last and how much of it was genuine disappointment. But I 100 percent agree that like the stuff with the Nightcrawlers at the end of it was just so ham fisted. I would I would rather they just not be in the game at all, and we'll get, I'm sure we'll get into it more later. Uh, gameplay wise, I loved that final map. Story wise, what the hell was even going on there? Uh, we're going to be starting off with um uh, it might actually be my favorite part potentially is uh what's going on in the monastery so essentially with um fire emblem three houses everything takes place in a monastery it's kind of like uh, the medieval high school i guess and um uh, and right off the bat you you have to choose one of the three different houses um of fodland i guess shockingly and, early uh, shockingly early like uh, barely out of the intro movie early mm-hmm. um and it's it's i don't know i guess they just expect people to do some research before i guess but they really don't give you any indication of what what you're getting yourself into or even that the choice at that point is even that significant yeah i i think they didn't even really hint that much in pre-release just how different the, the routes were intending to be um and i like a significant a significant part of a rant i'm gonna go on later is how much they aren't different but also <laughs> yeah. they still really are the three routes are telling very different stories um which is kind of insane that you don't know that at the start you don't even know what the nature of, of them is going to be i think that i think there's something interesting or maybe unique about making a choice without a lot of information and just kind of going with your first impression or going with your gut like hey i think this guy looks cool i'm gonna go with their side or um i I like i like kind of the characters that they're associating with this house the the side characters i I know there's going to be relationships there i want to get to know these characters so i i don't i don't consider it like a fault or anything that that's how it's set up i think you can have stories or uh, kind of games with a heavy narrative element where you make decisions that are going to impact the story at least to your knowledge without having a lot of background information um and i I, i'm with you david i think that monastery gameplay was probably my favorite part as well or close to it um, I, I liked exploring the grounds. I liked talking to the different characters. I liked going to doing silly things like going to the greenhouse and planting flowers and, and getting benefits from, you know, getting rewards from doing so. Um, I liked, you know, going to the kitchen and having the characters sit down and seeing stats go up and relationships get better and increasing their motivation that way. Um, I felt like every time I would go to the monastery, at least especially in the first half of the game and see like all these kind of conversation bubbles on the map all these places to go to talk to people i'm like oh that's really cool like everyone's got something new to say i'm gonna go through everybody and just see how everybody's doing like i'm kind of checking up on everybody i think that felt like it made sense given that you are an instructor in the monastery that you are kind of taking care of everybody you're kind of maybe fostering relationships you're growing this population that's there right you're growing your relationships with everybody your, your, your rapport um i i like that element i think it i think it fit with the theme of the game and uh, i always looked forward to doing that until i got to like you know hour 20 25 and i'm like okay guys i don't really care how you're doing now i just want to see how this all turns out right <laughs> yeah so. i was enamored with the monastery at first and i'm i made a point to to make the most of it as much as i could um but around the time that i hit the time skip uh, and got into part two, it started to wear thin, and I kept going for it because I had you know started I'd started this this path that I was going down with optimizing my units and everything, so I stuck with it. But I I 
wasn't really enjoying it that much anymore by the end of my first playthrough. And once I started my second playthrough, I kind of found myself just like hitting auto instruct and skipping through a lot of the monastery stuff. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I was the same. And I realized over the course of my second playthrough how little the stuff you're doing in the monastery actually matters. Uh, it's really cool as flavor text. Um, and I was continually impressed through a large portion of the game how often characters had new unique dialogue, even in part two, when you recruited them from a different house and they weren't even supposed to be there. Um, that was really, really cool. But besides that, it's like by the by the time that I got to my third playthrough, I wasn't I was skipping everything in the monastery because not only was I kind of sick of it, I realized that I wasn't losing anything for not doing it. So I'm really conflicted on it because for the for 30 hours of gameplay, I thought it was incredible and I thought that it added so much. And then I started to see the cracks and it just stopped like the magic kind of pulled away to show the harsh reality of the computer system in front of me. And I don't know how to feel about it now. Well, I think the enjoyment came from the discovery, like discovering the new things you could do. Um, the problem com becomes is when you've mastered them and you realize that, like you said, there's not really much to it. Mm -hmm. Like learning. I, I know my favorite part uh, of, fi of Three Houses was uh, the interactions between the characters. So essentially, f like building the relationships up between uh, Byleth and the characters and then also fig uh, discovering that you can build the relationships between the characters themselves and then get the dialogue between them. And then you kind of learn a lot of Fodlin's history just in their dialogues and, and seeing their relationships blossom. Uh, but once I've kind of figured out, okay, well, you know, sending someone to talk to in the choir, like I, you, you kind of realize it's like, okay, if I want to see how like Lorenz and Hilda's relationship goes and how, how their history ends up turning out it's like okay i, I gotta go to choir practice and choose those two or i've gotta pick a meal where it's like the favorite of them both and then but once you've kind of figured out and mastered okay how can i maximize um the relationship points between everyone it, it just becomes like work like it's, it's chore at that point like the finding the lost items to boost like it's just a it's a fetch quest essentially it's like uh, and I know even there, I, I remember laughing at one where the Shamir told me to go find something and it was in the same area. I didn't even have to leave mm -hmm. Those fetch the designated area. Like I, I turned around. I'm like, oh, there it is. Those fetch quests it is. got really old really fast. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's like, um, Shamir, I, I like you and, you know, I want to help you. But you you it was in your field of vision. You could have walked over and picked it up. I, I hate like it was that bad. I hate to say this because I did love it so much for the first chunk of the game, and it 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 is responsible for a lot of people being interested in the game. But I really think the game would be better if the monastery gameplay just wasn't there. Um, and it's like I feel a little vindicated by that because it was the main concern I had in the lead up to the game. Uh, and thankfully, I still ended up liking a lot of other things. But the monastery gameplay, I feel especially for the way the game is structured where it wants you to play it multiple times and it stops being fun before you're even done playing it once it's just yeah, too I, much i don't know if I'm, i would I'm, take it out i i think i think the problem for me was is that um it the really only two options for me were monastery or battle because like rest is useless and seminars were useless so if there was if there was a third option that was actually interesting that that was a a useful um, distraction or replacement then I don't know if the monastery would have been like you could pull some of that stuff out like to me they could have removed the lost items completely. Oh, uh, I hated them. The lost items were completely pointless other than just fetch quests to to raise your relationship levels. Like that was really the only purpose of them. So get rid of those completely. Um, they could have made some of the quests, like if there was some kind of third option where it's like, you know, here's the quest. And then I don't know if there's like an exploration of Fodlin or something, but there just needed to be something else to distract you. There was just too much time spent at the monastery. Uh, and then the battles that the other thing, too, was that 
like the prologue battles and that sort of thing like they were good to build up levels but like jordan was saying it was i I, my first playthrough was on normal and it was so easy that they like the battles weren't lasting very long there were like three or four turns it was like it got to the point where i just i just threw like it wasn't even strategy it was okay everyone run towards the enemy (laughs) because no no one's dying just everyone run towards the enemy I was thinking about, I kind of have a, maybe an idea in the middle of you two, or maybe a solution that I could propose. And I think it's that the first half of the game with the monastery, I think, works to a point. I think there there's a side quest and the lost items, I think, don't work. I would take out both of those. But I think it's coming back after the time skip and, oh, you know, the monastery is basically the same as it was, even though all these bad things have happened. It's supposedly in disrepair. But you go back and it's almost like things are the same as normal. I wish they had done something different. I wish it had been like, okay, we're we're just going to have to camp outside the monastery or we're going to have to like do things as we go. Like maybe like they're like kind of like migrating from place to place and doing training on the road, doing teaching on the road rather than like the exact same setting you've been in for 20 plus hours, right? Going back to the monastery in the second half of the game feels very hollow, I think. And I don't think it works thematically either. Um, I think the idea is that, you know, it's it's almost like, okay, we've already got this place. Let's just keep using it. Uh, You know, I, I really wish they had done a different setting for the second half, considering what's happening in the world at large for the monastery to be basically the same as it was from before. Oh, we'll just tidy it up. We'll just repair it. It won't take that long. I, I, I think it just rings hollow to me. I wish there, I wish they had done something different with that. Maybe even just skip that entirely. And it would be kind of cool, like obviously risky, but if it was like, Oh, you know, you didn't, you didn't train your characters enough in the first half of the game. Well, you're, in, you're going to be in trouble in the second half. Like I kind of like that a little bit. I know it's a little bit unfair, but I think with the way Fire Emblem games are challenging normally, I would just like to see you know them take a risk like that maybe. It's also kind of like story wise, it gets really silly the the monastery yeah. in the second half of the game because in Crimson Flower when you're playing at, with Edelgard uh, as the Empire invading the kingdom, uh, mm-hmm. you you make you make a little progress in invading the kingdom. You take a fort. Okay, now let's double back to the monastery. Okay, now we're going yeah. past that fort and we're taking this uh, this uh, this town. Okay, we got the town. Now let's go back to the monastery. Okay, now yeah, tomorrow it's, it's weird. It's weird. Tomorrow we're taking this strategic point outside the uh, the capital. Okay, we got that. Let's go back to the monastery. It's it's, it's ridiculous. Yeah, I I got the same feeling of to not to the same extent, but in Golden Deer as well. That why do we keep going back here? when we're trying to make progress in distant parts of the of the country right like it 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 does seem like really uh, just didn't didn't fit didn't didn't make a lot of sense and it, it is that part is a little bit disappointing and another reason why i kind of rushed through the second half and did a lot of resting uh and the seminars is because i, I didn't really care about the stats at that point i just wanted to get to the next story battle like i thought the monastery mm. stuff was yeah it's well, not think... working out that much at that point point. and in the second half i think it would have been more interesting if the base of operations was the place like the house that you chose so like if you're in the empire then mm-hmm. the base of operations should have been the empire uh, like unfortunately like, unfortunately it, i think there was like just too much work would have gone into it like actually on the crimson yeah, flower yeah. route you do for exactly one chapter have a different base of operations but it's an empty square room uh mm. so <laughs> well getting into the battle system too they the one thing that i was pr- fairly happy with is that there, there seemed to be a good variety of maps mm. uh, now there was there was a lot of reuse for sure you say that but yeah you, once you've played multiple routes you realize it's really not that many yeah they were they reuse a lot of maps um and for the most part they do a good job with it um between crimson flower and azure moon the Edel- edelgar route and the blue lines route There were a lot of reused maps, but they reused them in different contexts. You would start in a different Mm. place, there would be different gimmicks, it was the same physical layout, but it felt like a different battle. And I liked that a lot. But then after my my Blue Lions playthrough, I played Golden Deer, and it's like, oh, this is the same battle, the same chapter. There were a couple different ones, but they were almost all the same. And then, ultimately, I never ended up playing Silver Snow because I... Sorry. Ultimately, I never ended up playing Silver Snow because I looked it up, and all of the maps are identical to Golden Deer. They're the exact mm. same chapters. And so it's just like, there's a lot of reuse of assets going on here. 
I think my favorite map was probably, um, I'm sure it was seen a few times, but the one uh, for Lorenz's prologue, uh, like the Gloucester um, area. Yes. The one, the one with like the river in the middle of it, and there's the drawbridges. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cause and yeah, then there's like a there's a base uh, that you had to defend as well. It just seemed like it had the most variety for a map, or one of the most anyway. The, one of the more memorable ones. And then there was trees that you could utilize, and yeah, it's definitely better than that stupid forest that you fight um, Lonato in. <laughs> they that, <laughs> yeah. that's such a boring map, and they use it a thousand times. Hmm. Yeah, is that the one too where um. You go to get the Western Church as bishop, and you're literally just in the middle of a fog. Yep, that's the one. Yeah, yeah, that was that was my least favorite for sure. I wish they had used Fog of War a little bit better because I do I do like that mechanic in tactics games, but I thought the Fog of War maps in in this game and Three Houses weren't that effective. They were just kind of like, oh, let's let's do some let's spice it up a little bit just by adding Fog of War, but it's not going to be on top of an interesting map itself. It's just going to be that's the one gimmick that they have, right? Um, the second half I thought did have some, a little bit better variety with the maps and more, more, you know, more enjoyable things like some larger castles with the ballistae that you could use and the teleport pads. I, I like stuff like that. Um, I, I wish that there had been more maps that maybe made use of locked doors and chests and things like that. So you're kind of rewarded for exploring or for, for killing the enemies that had the, the keys if you needed to get those right. Like I would like to see more of that. Uh, I, I did feel like a lot of the objectives were just either kill everybody or kill the captain rather than uh, what I like to see is, uh, you know, get to this point or, or have everybody escape or last survive 10 turns or something like that. Um, where maybe like on the 10th turn or the, the ninth or eight, eighth or ninth turn, just by the end, like there's tons of enemies and there's no way to, to, you, you really have to be in a strategic spot to be able to survive. You maybe, maybe one of my reasons with the, or, my reason for not loving the map variety is because I just, again, I found the game so easy. I was just kind of blazing through it at the end. You would really like Path of Radiance and Radiant Dawn. It has a lot of variety and yeah. mission objectives. I've, I've heard as much and I, I, I do want to play them, but I, yeah, I, I, I'm not going back to where the, where they originally came out. So I, I am like, like, like we said earlier, I do really hope they get to come to switch at some point or get, get put out again. Yeah. And do you guys miss the weapons triangle? I do. I do too. I think that um, I see a lot of people celebrating that the weapon triangle is gone, but I feel like it makes tactics more arbitrary and it makes things, it, I think it contributes to things being too easy um, because I, I've seen people complain that it's like, oh, well, this guy, my guy's got a sword, but that guy's got a lance, so I might as well not even bother attacking. And it's like, well, yeah, it's a strategy game. You, you got to plan who's going to do what. And it kind of just got exhausting knowing that i could put petra in front of anyone and she would kill them um yeah that was that was the way way with uh, shamir because i think it was the archers were weak against magic but i built up her magic so it, it really like she was just one-shotting everybody by the end yeah and i they did it because shadows of valencia didn't have a weapons triangle mm -hmm. but the reason that shadows of valencia didn't have a weapons triangle is because in fire emblem gaiden the game that they were remaking the weapon triangle didn't exist yet so literally no one that you recruited in the entire game used axes. They actually couldn't do the weapon triangle. Uh, so I was okay with it there. But bringing it into this game, it's just kind of dumb, especially when everyone can use every weapon. So it's like if you really get bothered by it, like just give someone a sword, axe, and lance. I, yeah, I, I accidentally gave um, a couple people... I think Ingrid, I had her on a Pegasus, and I and she had her normal lance, and then um, I think she had picked one won a bow and arrow and somewhere or picked it up off the map or something and used it once by accident. And I'm like, why why aren't I giving her bow and arrow? Like it it didn't click into my. It's like ah, I just let her fire off bows and arrows. She's got a Pegasus. She could fly off like halfway across the map, snipe a couple people, and come back. Mm -hmm. Um, by the end, I, I had so many people using bows and arrows, just like you, David, I'm sure like it, it's such a, you know, a powerful strategy, I thought. And I, I trained a lot of my guys to be proficient in bows and arrows too. Especially Claude, because Claude gets yeah. a relic bow and arrow and, and there was, there was no stopping, no stopping my golden deer team by the end because, mm -hmm. uh, Blyleth 
It didn't matter if there was 15 people that would have attacked her in one one uh, turn. It, like she would have one shot every single one of them. Yeah, like nobody was same. nobody was even hitting her in normal mode. It was ridiculous. Like they would just miss and she would one shot. Then the miss and then one shot. Um, and even Claude was the same. Like Claude was on the Wyvern and would just uh, roll up, shoot, roll back, and if somebody tried to get him, he'd shoot him. Like it was. Uh, but it, uh, my second playthrough actually went on the difficult mode, and I didn't find it any different. Yeah, so th- this this was the first Fire Emblem that I ever started on hard difficulty, and I felt like I was playing on normal. Yeah, yeah. Uh, like it, it, I've heard, I've heard that, I've heard that from so many people who've played the game. So I'm, I'm really looking forward. They're adding a new difficulty soon-ish. Is that right, Matt? There's no release date for it, but they're, they're okay, they are okay. adding, they're adding two difficulties. They're adding a lunatic difficulty, which uh, some yeah. things have been data mined for it, and it's, it looks mm. kind of interesting at least. Uh, okay, okay. And then there's going to be a, I forget the actual name for the fourth one. I think it's Infernal because that's what they call it in Heroes, mm. but it's, it's like. It's just the difficulty where it's just like, okay, well, have fun. Good luck. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. If you're a glutton for punishment, go for it. I, but otherwise. I hope that Lunatic isn't too stupid. Like, Infernal can mm. be stupid. Like, that can be the one yeah. where it's like, you need to min max or you're screwed. But sure. I hope that Lunatic is just a genuinely difficult uh, mode where you you don't have to do stupid cheese tactics but you need to really mm. think because the only yeah. the only maps where i had ever had to really put in strategy were the the final maps for each route and i don't think mm. it's a coincidence that those three maps were my favorite maps in the entire game yeah i'm definitely waiting for these new difficulties to show up before i do my next playthrough just cuz because of what i've heard of of hard difficulty as it is and what I've experienced with normal is just not it's not enough for what I'm looking for in a second playthrough. So, uh, yeah, hopefully hopefully we'll hear about this soon. Maybe 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 in September um, they, they, they're going to have to date the the DLC that's coming at some point as well. Right. So, yeah, eventually. And it shouldn't be shouldn't be too long. And I really I I'm really saddened that it's that it's I just feel the game is too easy because a lot of the, me- the core mechanics that they're going for, I think, are incredible. Um like the the gambit thing that's new the battalions are brand new i think they add so much once you start to really understand what gambits are capable of and start using them as crowd control like like you could be like oh god there are six guys in front of me and they're going to kill someone i can use a gambit to stop them from moving like they they open up so many tactical options and then from there okay they're not going to move for a turn do i engage or do i retreat and I felt so excited every time I was like, maybe retreating is the right option. Maybe thinking hmm. tactically is the right option. And Gambits gave me the ability to do that. Uh, I thought that was so good. Gambits adds so much. And I love I love that mounted units can dismount to negate their their weaknesses while taking away their strengths mm-hmm. too. Yeah, I was gonna I was gonna talk about that because you can also, after you've moved, you can I think you can equip a different weapon. So that you're prepared for whatever comes at you, whatever, whatever, it, you know, you know, a, a guy who's going to attack you, you're going to attack them back with whatever weapon you've you've left on yourself or you've used last or something like yeah. that. But then when you to remove the weapon triangle, but have that mechanic seems kind of like what what what's the, what the hell's the point, right? You've 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 almost set yourself up for the weapon triangle to really shine in that regard, but then you don't you don't actually have it. So you've got all these different elements that make the game more strategic, more tactical, but you don't even need them given the given the difficulty of the game. Uh, so yeah, it just doesn't seem to those kind of things seem to go against each other. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm with you. I'm hoping that the the two difficulties they add give you a good reason to make use of gambits to give you a good reason to really care about the way you prepare your characters and uh you know equipping the right abilities and uh and and using their special moves more often you know i i feel like i didn't need to care about that stuff at all i i I switched out my battalions just to see the differences between them but I, i didn't even need to worry about that they were all fully leveled up and i didn't switch to like the you know a plus rank uh battalions after i after i uh had the ability to equip them i didn't even need i didn't need them at all right yeah, and I just I I want more maps where I just feel exhausted at the end, because I, I I love the ones that really push me hard, and I think um, the Golden Deer ending was a little easier than I would have liked before. Like suddenly the final boss himself is just like twenty levels above me and just punches me and I die. Um, 
but the the crimson flower and blue lions endings uh those those maps are incredible uh the crimson flower ending has pegasus knight knight reinforcements that can that can do a ton of damage to you so you need to strategic like they're constantly coming so you need to think okay uh, th- there's guys in front of me i need to make progress but i need to be ready for these guys coming from behind that are going to that are going to mess me up and the blue lions finale in addition to ha- um it's the map that it's on it's it's in like the 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 throne room map that you play in golden deer but you start all the way in the back so you need to go all the way forward there's a there's a bunch of of monster enemies around there's uh, those samurai units that can just screw you up and the boss has a 30 range spell that it can just throw stuff at you from literally the other side of the map and it can attack twice per turn and i loved it it was so good it was the best map in the game and i feel that way because it's the only map that that and the crimson flower ending were the only maps that really pushed me to think tactically they were the two maps where i really had to sit and think that every single unit with specifically where they were standing mattered and i want more of that because this game is so so ready with the gambits with mounting and dismounting with all the options that i have for different weapons for different people the skills which we haven't even talked about yet i thought all of them were really good if if the game gives me the opportunity for min maxing all of this stuff to be really significant then it would be so, so, so good. And part of the reason that I was on such a high for my first playthrough is that I didn't start to see the cracks. I didn't start to see how much it didn't really matter because it was kind of too easy. So if they put out a difficulty level that makes it real difficult so that all this stuff does matter, it could be one of the best games in the series as far as the gameplay goes. The story is always going to have the problems that it has. But the gameplay could legit be one of the best in the series if they if they mm-hmm. take advantage of it uh I, I just wanted to kind of summarize my thoughts about the the gameplay as well because we're i think we're kind of approaching the end of that segment um i you've got you've got this potential in this game for there to be really you know dynamic kind of series defining gameplay and they've just missed a, a bunch of little things i think that don't give it purpose right it, 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 we we talk so much about difficulty these days and being able to cho- kind of choose your own difficulty and making games accessible but fire emblem it, it maybe has has always been a series where difficulty and how you play the how you actually do the gameplay the choice you make there is really important right if you play the game where you're where there's permadeath right the classic way that's a very very different experience than playing it casually where your characters come back after they die playing a normal where you can just use one character to run through every single map is a very different experience from maybe one of the difficulties they're going to add where every single character movement and skill and weapon that you use and weapon you leave them equipped with at the end of their movement all of those things matter again a very different game a very different experience so it's very i think it's possible that to, to play this game six months from now when maybe a little maybe the dlc has added a couple of things maybe they've they, they've added these two difficulties and they're maybe they're just right they're just right for the mechanics that are built into the game where it forces you to think and consider every move very carefully as opposed to just you know getting one character super strong and just running them through the entire game or two or three characters that are really broken and that that's all you need right you kind of just sit there and every enemy that attacks you they just get annihilated and you don't get a scratch on you very different gameplay experiences and i i'm eager to see what happens in my next playthrough uh i want to i want to you know take a little bit more time away from this game cuz i think my thoughts are um still kind of coalescing i know i know we're talking about the game today and i'm still thinking about you know i'm hearing your guys' opinions on it. it's really kind of helping me understand how i feel about the game but i think i'm i'm left feeling like i didn't get to have that fire emblem experience that i really enjoy that i've had you know especially in games like awakening and shadows of valentia where where i left characters at the end of a move really mattered and matt you talked about like kind of those those marathon battles that take 30 45 minutes 60 minutes the end game level and you're of like blue lions took me two hours 
it did it really oh, okay yeah. i'm i'm kind of, i'm looking forward to something like that because you, you, there's that feeling you get or that that uh event you experience in fire emblem that i really like when it's 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 hour you're an hour into the map you're you're just about to beat it and one of your most important characters dies the character you really like the character character maybe you're hoping to form a relationship with it by the end of the game they die and you're like oh my god what just happened and you 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 have that decision to make do i just beat beat the stage and go on with my go on with my playthrough losing that character or do i go back to my save before the map started and i replay the map to pr- to preserve that character to make sure they don't die i didn't have any moments like that in three houses and that's probably the first fire emblem game i've played where i never experienced that and that was really disappointing to me um and it does kind of yeah i guess maybe taint my overall experience or impression of the game because I, I I yearn for those. I look forward to those in this game. I want to make those kind of, you know, really difficult choices in, in, a, in a Fire Emblem game, in a strategy game. So for that to not come up here, yeah, that, that, that really hurt the experience for me. Okay, so we're going to, uh, it's time for the spoiler cast part of the episode, so if you really d- don't want to hear about, uh, we're going to spoil the absolute shit out of this. We're going to be talking about the endings of multiple uh, storylines, uh, the different playthroughs. It's, the story is a little batshit crazy, so I think we, we need to discuss it and uh, criticize it and talk about what's good and what's bad and basically uh, break it down and, and just hash out all the details, so... No, I'm pretty sure that no matter what, I guess what we should start with, technically there are three choices. Mm -hmm. However, there are four uh, distinct storylines. I'm going to level with you. There are three distinct storylines. You just play one of them (laughs) twice. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, so so, uh, Black Eagles, uh, there's a fork in the road. uh, I guess it's like February, March, I guess it is. Uh, Something like that, yeah. Um, and that'll split into two, and then, yeah, the deer and the lions are their own. Mm-hmm. Uh, I believe if, if you, no matter which one you're playing, up until about February, it's more or less It's completely the same. The same. Yeah. Uh, so you get... You- like, I think there's just the focus, there's a focus depending on the house that you're in, to a certain degree. Yes, you get... You get but it's still pretty much the same. You get cutaway cutscenes where you see different perspectives, mm-hmm. and I think those are really good. Um, like in the beginning of the game, when you fight Sylvain's brother, after that, I I distinctly remember how different the scenes are between Edelgard and Dimitri. Edelgard says that she like this is a big part of where her motivations come in. She says that uh, the way that crests are so overvalued in this society leads to good people who are who have a lot of of talent and value being pushed to the wayside simply because they don't have crests. The crests mm. are to blame for all of this and the the corrupt system of castes and importance based on your birth is causing these problems. Meanwhile, the exact same scene with Dimitri has him explain that it is regrettable that things like these happen, and he does not think that Sylvain's brother should have been cast aside the way that he was. But there is a value to the crests, because they do make you stronger. And that allows a system where the strong can protect the weak. And if they didn't have that system in place, imagine how things could collapse without people who were dedicated to serving the populace and protecting them. And it's two drastically different viewpoints on the same events. And that is like, that almost makes the monotony of playing part one four times worth it. (laughs) Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because I'd say the golden deer is a bit of a mix of the two because it's his, Claude's focus really isn't on the crests. He's more focused on boundaries. Uh, that he he doesn't like that there's separate countries. Like he's kind of the 
uh, one fold lid, one world sort of thing mm-hmm. where it's it shouldn't matter where you're born. Go- um, Golden Deer is about everyone should just be Golden Deer is about ending racism. Happy. That's why I recruited Ingrid yeah. on that route, because I feel like she could learn a couple things there saying that uh, <laughs> the genocide of uh, the people of Dusker was kind of the right thing to do. Nah, I'm good, Ingrid. <laughs> This is this is a good time as any. This this is just a little, neat little bit of trivia that I really like. Uh, so the fourth house, like the fourth route, was like a big surprise secret, but that based on the Japanese title, it's actually not. This the Japanese title of the game. It's Fire Emblem Fukasetsugetsu, and Fukasetsugetsu is a generic phrase that is usually translated as Four Seasons, which is why you know Seasons of Warfare is the, the special edition. But, literally, it translates to wind, flower, snow, and moon, which corresponds with the four routes. So, uh, verdant wind, crimson flower, silver snow, and azure moon. It's really cool. It's just a stupid bit of trivia, but I think it's really cool. So, based on that trivia, Matt, what, can we speculate about why they didn't just call the game Fire Emblem Four Seasons? Uh, because of the Four Seasons Hotel. I don't know um yeah the the phrase i the phrase four seasons well four seasons has been used a lot though like even uh like wasn't there like legend of zelda kind of used used seasons uh in oracle one, of seasons yeah yeah like uh, i think i don't know seasons but what about four out. but four something right like the fact that there's four routes but the it's three houses and yeah i get there's three houses but that that idea of going from three to four is is I don't know I think it's a significant difference right I think a lot of people were surprised to find out that there's four routes or or maybe it, in disbelief a little bit but again like you said Matt if you translate the Japanese it makes perfect sense that there's four yeah and uh, but I I think yeah, I think on. the literal meaning of wind flower snow and moon there's no way they could have translated that and I think that's the more mm. important part. Yeah, four elements, four, I don't know, four, 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 four orbs of light, right, David? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Find something well, here. But. I mean, the other thing, too, is, like you said, though, is uh, there might be four roots, but there's really only three endings. Yeah. Because mm. the two the two endings are similar. Um, so maybe we'll get into that. So each of the each of the three endings, I guess, are, are all different. Um, so, the Golden Deer ending, which was the one that um, Jordan and I ended up doing first, yeah. Um, so that one is very focused. Um, again, Claude is focused on ending racism, and and that one really was focused on the church and the kind of enemies that are teased throughout that you don't really see in the first half. Their the, official the one their official th- title is "Those Who Slither in the Dark," which is a terrible That's the name. Worst, the worst. Terrible so names. we call yeah. them Nightcrawlers because it's a better name. And Treehouse, that's yeah. what you should have called them. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, and that's basically... Uh, and then the ending of that one was disappointing to me because... So, as Claude, like, you do run into the other two houses. Um, the the second half of the game essentially is following Claude taking back Fodlin from the Empire. Like, Edelgard has been, is... Um, they've taken over the kingdom and they kind of have a pact with the alliance where they're they're kind of a dummy state, I guess, or a puppet state. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. And Claude is working to to work, get get Foldlin back, I guess, from under the empire's grasp. So you kind of see them working their way towards the um, the capital. And uh, personally, like I said, the the story to me should have ended when Edel uh, Edelgard was defeated. Like that should have been the ending, <laughs> which is the ending um, of the Blue Lions route, by the way. Yeah, uh, so to me that should have been the ending. But what ends up happening is um, after the after the win, and this this is another shallow thing to me is that they receive a letter. Oh God, I was so from stupid. Hubert. It's, it's so, so bad. stupid. It's, really bad. it's like, oh well, we just could, you know. Uh, Hubert told me to give you this letter if if they lost. And I'm like, oh, are you kidding oh me? Okay. Like, you're not serious. So, oh, well, the real enemy is, uh, you know, hiding in this mountain somewhere. And I'm like, come on. So it's so weird because in the Crimson Flower route where, you was, where you're playing on the Empire side with Edelgard, Hubert and Edelgard are constantly saying, okay, the Nightcrawlers, they're, they're fucked up. Uh, I was, can we swear? Yes. Okay, yeah. Okay, cool. <laughs> the, the Nightcrawlers are fucked up. They are they are the bad guys 
But right now, we need to work with them because we cannot achieve our goals of ending this corrupt system without them. So once we finish this, then we're taking them out. And you, f- you quote unquote, finish this in chapter 18. Every other route has 22 chapters, mind you. 22. Four chapters is enough to be like, okay, we're going to fight the Nightcrawlers now. Chapter 18 rolls around. Credits roll. And it says, and then they beat the Nightcrawlers. Oh my gosh. I didn't know about that at all. That's horrible. Uh, okay. And it doesn't make sense because you defeat the Nightcrawlers in two other... Uh, Routes. Yes, and, and 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 they all all they had to do was take the Raya stuff out. And I have to I have yeah. to say, I really like Crimson Flower. Um, it's the only route that decides to examine the the like things from an angle of like, is is like is Raya actually kind of messed up? Is she doing the wrong thing? And the answer is well, kind of because she burns Ferdiad, the kingdom capital, to the ground just to spite you. Mm. <laughs> she does that she is capable of being very bad but also i really like that no one in this game is 100 percent good or 100 percent bad i really really like that yeah except the nightcrawlers um i love that and uh so i really like crimson flower but it's like okay we're at chapter 18 there there's four chapters left right that is exactly enough time for an arc where we fight the nightcrawlers nah yeah. nah we're going to have Hubert give well, Claude a letter. <laughs> yeah. Well, and they, they actually lost me before that, too, because um, I I was actually really digging the relationships and the stories and the history of Fosland. And then the Death Knight leaves the fort and oh. nukes the fort. I And I lost I it. Think it's, you're, it's really bad. <laughs> I think you guys are overstating this. No, it was it, it was bad. a missile. It was a physical steel, and it had. I took a picture on. Um, there's a split second where they showed the missile in the air, and you could see it's a missile. It's steel, Sir, what, and it's got it's got a stamp on Sir, what's, it. Sir, what's stamp. what's your favorite RPG on on the Switch again? <laughs> no, but they <laughs> set up a they set up a world where, where that is possible. Like there was nothing in up in Fire Emblem up until that point. Which made it seem like there was any kind of technology available. Like magic, uh, if that nuke was a magic nuke from from wherever, if it, came, if it was just some bolt of lightning that nuked the place, I wouldn't care. The fact that it was a steel missile with the freaking circles around it. And and then the reasoning behind the re- uh, why they couldn't just nuke the monastery is so thin. Oh, while well, the St. Saros' body was there. Or not St. Sarah said, the, the pro- there was some kind of magical protection that they couldn't be nuked. And it's like, well, well, no, it's a metal. Like, what are you talking about? You can't nuke the monastery. Like, this is ridiculous. Like, it's... It like, was... gunpowder, gun in theory, hasn't even been invented. There's no guns. There's no cannons. They're still yeah. still using bows and arrows. But I... somehow the there's, a space sta- nukes. <laughs> there's, there's a space station somewhere up in the fr- freaking sky that's yeah, shooting yeah. nukes down. Like, no, that's bullshit. I am of Like, Matt, I'll, I'll give you... I. I don't. I don't hate it as much as David. I know David. Like David, like texted me on on Slack. It's like, oh, I can't believe it just happened. I'm like, I I know I know it was really bad. Like I I I I, I dislike it for sure. It shouldn't be there. It didn't lose me. But just that those last few chapters where you're fighting the Nightcrawlers, I just didn't find it compelling at all. I'm just like, yeah. The, the I don't think the, those villains were really set up that well throughout the story right they, they they don't they just kind of they're in the shadows they're maybe they're pulling strings maybe they're oh we're gonna fight them eventually but the more compelling narrative is the one between the three houses between the three yeah. main characters mm. and the, what's going to happen with the country so the when you insert like this evil force or this evil entity kind of behind the scenes and like oh oh they're actually the big bads like it, it's such a it's such a tried video game trope and i just hate to see that yeah, so I, yeah. I i have nothing good to say about the night crawlers don't you worry but yeah. I will say, and, and now I, you're going to say something good. I think <laughs> I think that the idea of okay, we're in a a, a distant a, a real world historical setting, uh, but there is an ancient race that has technology. That's a classic trope. I don't see that as being a huge deal. 
the problem if is if they have nukes, how are they not just destroying everybody? Because the, uh, how have they how have they not just won the war? Because, like how do they not how do they not take over? Because the world? Sothis's remains are in the monastery and it protects them. It's whatever. It's, you know, it's, it's fine. <laughs> oh, oh, that <laughs> part. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, uh, it makes perfect sense. <laughs> <laughs> even even though technically Sothis's remains were not in the monastery, they, I mean they were in Bylith, I mean, for re- the heart of. Uh, for real, the answer is the relics. The relics are all powerful, pretty mm-hmm. much. Um, yeah. But the Nightcrawlers are woefully underdeveloped. Um, yeah. Like that, that, that's, well, that's, the, that's the part I don't like is that you've spent all this time like getting to know Edelgard, Dimitri, and Cloud, and then someone else shows up for the end of the game to kind of steal that thunder a little bit. And by the time you've you've finished twenty two chapters and you beat the the Nightcrawler King, what is his name? Thalus. Thalus, yeah. Like you, you've already for it's, you know, your but defeat of Edelgard is already yeah. in the rearview so mirror, here, right? So and then it's that and then it's a, it. it's a double bluff though because he's not even the final boss. But so so he, even though he would make more sense. Here's a fun question for you. So you know, Solon was actually was was Tomas the librarian. Kronya was yeah. Monica the girl you saved. Who was Thalus? Do you guys know? Yeah, he was the uncle of Edelgard. Yeah, he was Edelgard's uncle. Mm, that okay. is something that is actually not ever explained in Edelgard's route, but it's important for you to know that, because otherwise, what he's doing doesn't make sense. Mm. Yeah. It's it's this weird Ouroboros of, like, you need to play all four routes for any of them to make total sense. I assume that's explained in Silver Snow. I don't actually know. I'm not going to play Silver Snow until the Lunatic difficulty's out. Um, I I literally just watched, like, the last chapter of Silver Snow and saw the reveals of, like, what is actually the deal with Byleth and their family. Um, but... Well, it, it's funny because in the in the Golden Deer playthrough, there was nothing that was even mentioned or hinted at that would have made you think that the night crawlers had any kind of affiliation with the ant- like other than like use using them as the tool to to defeat the church or whatever but it wasn't until i started the black eagles where you you get kind of hints of uh edelgard's history and, and i just kind of pieced together and like oh this guy's gonna be the uncle like it's 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 kind of crazy the, that it's like you like going you need to know going into crimson flower that uh, Edelgard's uncle is Thalys because otherwise you don't realize that the reason that she's working with them even though they're obviously evil and are responsible for everything wrong is because she doesn't have a choice they were like actually they were actually a higher rank in the empire than she was until she became the emperor when all this stuff was was in motion it's actually really important to know that to understand that Edelgard isn't just evil but they don't explain it so you're like you're kind of left being like well why is she working with them and it yeah. is explained okay, so it's I have explained to, in a different route i gotta ask a question so claude spends a lot of the golden deer playthrough kind of like uh maybe digging into what ray is doing with the church and like oh why is it so secretive i've got all these questions for her i want to ask her all these questions i want to find out what's going on what comes of that? Like, what of all his investigation and his being curious about it and, and wanting to ask her questions? What what's the result of that? Not a lot. <laughs> no, right? not, like, in, not in the so, story. Not in the such, story anyway. So, it's such a big part of that story. Every time you're talking to him, he's like, "Oh, I, w- I want to know what they're doing. I'm trying to I'm trying to find out more about this situation. What what's the church hiding? What's underneath here? Right? Like all well, the skeletons in the closet. But th- nothing comes of it. Well, like I, at least nothing memorable. So Rhea does explain that like the whole thing. Like she explains the whole thing. Of, I forget the name of them, but like the the the, the dragon people that are Sothis's children mm. and everything. She explains that in Golden Deer, but what she doesn't explain yeah. in Golden Deer, what she explains in Silver Snow, is is what she did to Byleth and Gerald. Mm. No, no, she she does it in Golden Deer. Not entirely. Yeah, she says that. Uh, oh, okay. Well, w- what I knew from Golden Deer was that um, she took the heart of Sothis. And put it in Byleth as like when she was born. So, so that's so so the heart of Sothis is inside of Byleth, would, and that's why why Sothis is like her consciousness is in Byleth at the beginning. Would you like to know what you learn in Silver Snow? Yes, yes, I would. That that's the whole point of this segment is that we're <laughs> we're answering all these uh, these questions. So in Silver Snow, it's explained that Byleth's mother 
is a homunculus created by Rhea, and it is in fact the last in a long line of homunculi that were an attempt to make a vessel for Sothis, and all of them were failures. But this homunculus happened to fall in love with Geralt, and she was dying in childbirth, so uh, the the crest stone of Sothis that was a part of uh, that was a part of Byleth's mother, this homunculus was transferred to Byleth so that Byleth could live. And that led to Byleth being a vassal for Sothis and everything. But Rhea has been trying with artificial humans to create a, a vessel for Sothis, and she has been creating these these entire lives with the express purpose of this person is going to be erased so that Sothis can live in their body. <laughs> okay, no, that wasn't that was not in the Golden Deal. It one. sure wasn't. And also Geralt is over a hundred years old. Yeah, that was I don't I don't think they ever said why he was old, but it was they definitely discussed Be- that because he, both the him and Byleth I because think, were Rhea older than has, they appeared. Rhea has some of uh sorry, no, Geralt has some of Rhea's blood because they she tells the story of how Geralt saved her life. He was mortally wounded, so like yes. she, she yeah, that gave was, him some of her blood yeah. so that he could become yeah, immortal. That was in Golden Deer, yeah. And then, and then, so, appa- and then apparently he just dies like a bitch to Cronia, whatever. So that's whatever, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. Well, and then so then that brings us to the my my other beef with the story was that the big bad, the final boss that I would call Nemesis. Is, you Nemesis, you literally see him for what thirty seconds at the beginning and never again. And his great reveal is what falling out of a cryogenic chamber. Yeah. Okay. So here's the thing. Here's the <laughs> thing. You can tell I've been drinking because I'm just starting to be like, whoa. Here's the thing. It's good. Let it go. Here's the thing. Over here. Anyone else like get really suspicious when the great hero king that united Fodlin is named Nemesis? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it doesn't really fit. Don't okay. Don't. That's not not, not ominous at don't all. Don't worry, we're complaining a lot about Golden Deer. Stick around because I'm gonna have some really good things to say about Blue Lions. Uh, but yeah. So I do. Ne- I do ne- want to say one thing about the story as a whole. Just for I'll let you go, Matt. But I, I'm just thinking about something, and that's that you you kind of have to play all four routes. I, I think we're we're coming. Maybe we're all in agreement about this. You have to play all four routes to fully understand the story of this game you do and I that by playing by playing one you, yeah. you by playing one you get a story but it's it's a fraction of the entire picture and i think you're missing actually key components by only playing one one route that's a hundred percent i hate it you're not even getting right? yeah you're not even getting one story you're, yeah. you're getting like three quarters of a story and then there's another three quarters of a story somewhere else that i that guess fills in the blank. You're, you're getting an ending to to a story right you're getting you're finding out what happens to to claude or dimitri or, or edelgard but you're not you're not finding out what happens to the world or, or where things started off or maybe everything that could have happened or something like that i think there's just so much missing from a single playthrough and i, I you know what i think we what's funny is i think we asked for this with fates i think we maybe wanted three stories in one game oh, i didn't want more of that fates. i can tell you to, that right now <laughs> I, I know i know but I, i'm just thinking of the idea the idea that a game has three different playthroughs and by playing each one you gain something new or you learn more about the one you just did as well and we've we finally got that with three houses and i feel like it's a lot it's a good it's, it's, a, it's a good game i just i i can't imagine going through it four times like i don't think i'm ever gonna do that you know it it, it sucks because i i do really hate fates um like i yeah. i could go on for hours about corin pl- kneeling before monster mash and pledging their loyalty to the graveyard smash but <laughs> at the like fates really did this specific thing better for every yeah. other problem it had it handled the fact that it was three different stories better than three houses did the mm-hmm. stories that it told were bad but they stood on their own while also intermingling with each other in interesting ways and the story that three houses is telling is so much better but it tells it in such a worse way and mm-hmm. you're one hundred percent right. You have to play all four routes to really understand what's going on. But it's so not worth playing all four routes. I I would I would recommend 
that you play at most two. And then if you're the kind of person... Read, up, read the rest. <laughs> if you're the kind of person that replays video games, then yeah, when you replay three houses, play a different route. By mm-hmm. all means. But when you play the other routes, that's what you're doing. You're replaying the same game. And that is the that is the biggest disappointment that I could have had in that you have to replay it to understand the story. Mm-hmm. But no effort is made to making replaying the story actually a unique experience. And that's why earlier yeah. I was saying, you know, my first two playthroughs, I was over the moon with it. And then my third playthrough, I wanted to die um, <laughs> yeah. because the expectation that you were going to play all four routes to understand the story implied to me that you were not replaying the game. You were playing a new section of the game, but you, Mm -hmm. you weren't playing a new section of the game. You were replaying the game and realizing that just made me really depressed, but that's just the way it is. Um, so uh, that, <laughs> we, we should get to the care. We should get to the character soon. I know we, we've been talking about the story for, for a little while here. I, I, I do have um, good things to say before we wrap that we up. That. Well, Matt. Yeah. What does what does Matt wrap wrap up the story discussion with? The, like just a summary of the the blue lines. I think that's the only one we haven't. <sighs> and then can you tell me the two? The, well, tell everyone who's listening. Tell the two routes you would recommend playing if you only choose. If you only chose two. If you only so ch- do both of if those. If you only choose two, it's blue lions yes. and crimson flower in that order. Okay. Okay. Blue Lions is the best route in this game. Mm. It is so, so good. So, like, what you guys were saying with, like, you wanted more of, like, the conflict between the houses, that's Blue Lions. Blue Lions yeah. doesn't care about the Nightcrawlers. They're not in it. Uh, that's good. I, yeah, it is, I'm, I'm, I'm in for that. that that's going to be my second playthrough, then. It is a character study on Dimitri and his mm. relationship with Edelgard, who, for some reason... Like, there is backstory for her in Blue Lions that isn't in Crimson Flower. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, but it, it establishes a history between Dimitri and Edelgard. And the the route examines Dimitri's troubles. Like, we've, we've all seen Dimitri in the trailers, how he becomes this bloodthirsty lunatic in, in the <laughs> second half. But, yeah. like, what's so interesting about him to me is that he's not bloodthirsty because he like because he wants revenge and because he likes it he's bloodthirsty because for the sake of the people that died to at Edelgar's hands he feels that he is he is their last avatar in the world and he needs to enact revenge on on Edelgard for their sake and that is troubling him he is literally haunted by their by his hallucinations of their ghosts he is so so troubled and he is a complex character chris hackney's voice acting performance as him is incredible and it makes for the one of my favorite characters in fire emblem history and it is a route about him and about him coming back from this deep deep depression and despair and trying to reconcile with edelgard trying to find some solution and ultimately going into the final battle with Edelgard feels like something that is that is significant to both of them. Mm-hmm. It is the route that is about characters, and it's not even just about Dimitri. It's, fe- uh, it's about Felix. It's about Ingrid. It's about Sylvain. Mm-hmm. It's about Ash, even. The part one is made for Blue Lions because you you fight Ash's dad. You fight Sylvain's brother. It's It's about all of them. It's about Dedu and the tragedy of Dusker. It's about Annette and her, her absent father who who came to the monastery instead of being with his family. It's about Mercedes who who learns Fortify and is pretty useful in gameplay and otherwise unremarkable. <laughs> it, I, oh man, you, the, the, what you're saying right now makes me really regret having played Golden Deer, even though I liked it. Because what you're saying is what I wanted from this game. I wanted these experience with these characters where we're doing things that are meaningful and we're, we're making tough choices or we're doing things that are going to cause us a lot of mental uh, difficulty, right? Uh, things that are going to be hard to process. Mm-hmm. Uh, traumatic, traumatic, uh, traumatic moments for these characters. I wanted more of that. Uh, you don't really get that in Golden Deer at all. Yeah. Well, and the unfortunate part too is I felt like the, the pre-release 
discussion was that the blue lines was the worst yeah one. Mm. no me like me and my friends like we we were having jokes that like the like blue lions is everyone's second playthrough like no one chose blue lions first and, <laughs> yeah but yeah. blue lions was far and away my favorite um i still i still have a soft spot for edelgard like i said i'm a sucker for representation and i've got i've got mm. my own my own personal issues with 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 all that stuff having a a lgbt lord was really important to me and i'm really 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 happy that we got that in edelgard i love edelgard's character and i love crimson flower but far and away blue lions and azure moon was the best route and if you only play one route play azure moon and if you play a second i'd say play crimson flower because as far as gameplay goes it's the most unique compared to azure moon and mm. I just like that one too, and it's also shorter, so you'll be done faster. Um, but Golden Deer, uh, Verdant Wind, and Silver Snow—they're identical. Don't play both; it's not worth it. <laughs> uh, um, you can play one. Don't play both. Uh, but God, Azure Moon, Golden Deer, uh, uh, Azure Moon, Blue Lions—so so good. Gameplay wise, that final map was incredible. Incredible! I cannot believe that they gave the uh, uh, the boss of that map thirty space range and attacks tw- two <laughs> turns, and I'm still here telling you it's my favorite map in the whole game. I just I love I love the Blue Lions route. I love Dimitri, Chris. I love Chris Hackney's performance. I love all the kids in Blue Lion in, in Blue Lions who out of the three routes, that's the one where the the supporting cast of the students they shine in the main story mm. they're connected to the main story more than either of the other two houses it's so 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 good and if if three houses was just blue lions and azure moon and they made the most of that story it very well might have been my favorite game in the franchise and unfortunately they didn't unfortunately it's got these problems where you need to play all four routes to really understand what's going on and it is not worth playing all four routes Unfortunately, it is not a perfect game, but Azure Moon and Blue Lions make like help me understand what the perfect Fire Emblem game could have been. Well, why don't we um, finish up the podcast with a, a rapid fire through all of the characters in each of the houses? Because really, I like you said, the the game really shines in its characters, like learning the histories, the the acting, the the emotions. As you just said, the the blue lines is your favorite because it's about them <laughs> and and not hidden enemies that that are hiding in the slithering in the shadows. Yep. So. Um, yeah, so why don't we, we'll start with Golden Deer. So the leader for the Golden Deer is Claude. Mm -hmm. So he's the, uh, enigmatic leader of the Alliance or the, the would be leader, I guess, is waiting for his grandfather to pass away so he could take over. Um, there's a little bit of mystery to his, uh, I know initially they were kind of making it sound like he might, he might not be like a blood of the grandfather that he might've been born in, um. Yeah, that that uh, Almira. I that think? thread was kind of abandoned, and it's like, yeah, yeah. he's definitely at least half Al- Almiron, right? Yeah, that's that's. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it, they too. never yeah. really. Well, and he was friends that. with the he was friends with the general because mm-hmm. the general ends up coming over f- uh, from Almira and helping uh, to defeat Adelgard. Yeah, so that's and uh, no, they they really dropped that, and it was disappointing. I would have liked to see a lot more of uh, that. Um, Claude, I think, is a very entertaining character. I think he's well written, and I like seeing him on screen. I'm kind of surprised at how much of a jerk he is. I yeah, well, I I joked that he was the Han Solo of Fire Emblem. Yeah, he really he really words. is. And he was always always going for uh, the trick move to to win the victory, the win at all costs, even if it's a little underhanded. Mm-hmm. Ironically, though, he never actually he he says that, but he never actually does it. He doesn't he doesn't actually do <laughs> yeah. any underhanded tactics to win. I don't think. Um, I, I liked him a lot. I, I thought his charisma was, was interesting to see. Uh, I, you know, I did, I did feel like I wanted to have him around. I, I, I did kind of form a, a bond with that character for sure. 
Um, but yeah, I, I do feel like there was some things that just kind of fizzled out, I guess. Like I, I did want to know more about his background and how, how that, how that influenced things. I, I liked when, uh, the Elmiron general kind of came to their rescue and, uh, I, I wish that, yeah, that had kind of been a bigger part of the game or a bigger part of the second half, maybe. Um, or even if there were hints about that, uh, earlier on that I think would have been good, but, um, yeah, I, I, I like using him a lot. You know, I think I, I like using ranged characters in this game and I was attracted to uh, the golden deer, especially because they're, they're supposed to be more uh, ranged focused, right. You know, with, with the spellcasters and the, the archers. So um, yeah, I, I liked him well enough. He's not my, my, one of my favorite fire emblem characters, but he, he was fine. Yeah. Uh, next up, we've got Hilda who was um, the, the one. So each house had a leader and then one person that you could not recruit. And Hilda was that particular one for golden deer. Sort of. So you, you had you sorry? can recruit her on blue lions but not on black eagles oh okay um and hilda it was funny like you could see the i like the evolution of her character because she started off with like finding any way like acting the victim or acting helpless or whatever she needed to do not to do chores and not to do work and uh and it really and even like uh i know she was asking not to be put on the battlefield uh, because she didn't think she she needed to fight or wasn't very good I at it. Just but didn't want to. by the end of the stories, yeah, she was she was well, she was one of my most powerful characters by the end. Yeah, my um, I was yeah, and in my in my playthrough, uh, Hilda and Claude ended up uh, marrying. I was really surprised at how like how much of a fully featured character Hilda is. Like she she kind of felt like she was just gonna be set up as like this one trick gimmick character, but there's a lot of depth to her. I was really pleasantly surprised. I liked her a lot. She came back after the time skip and I felt like she had really grown, you know, maybe compared to some of the other characters. I felt like she, in that time of way, she's kind of figured things out and she's, she's more mature. She's more, more of an adult at that point. And, um, you know, she's not, not exhibiting the same kind of, uh, immature or naive or innocent traits that she was, uh, during the first half of the game. So I, I did like that about her character. Next up is Matt's least favorite character in Fire Emblem. <laughs> Leone. She was my she was my strongest character, I think. Aside from Byla, she was my best yeah, one. Yeah, she's really strong and all, but I oh god. I just I don't like how she's just like, "Oh, you I'm a bigger fan of your dad than you are." And then it's like mm. after your dad dies, that's when she unlocks her B support where she's just like, "Man, I you know, professor, I want to like you, but you just don't love your dad enough." I I love your yeah. dad more than you do. I just I hate her so much. All my friends hate her too. And I think I, just, I don't. I think her uh, her final thing too was is that she was like, well, you you were his daughter, but um, I was I was his best oh his best student or something. I didn't get her A support. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> yeah. So it was uh, yeah it was interesting. I like again another character that in like a one trick pony in the first half, but then. Uh, she she really she she warmed up to Blyleth by the in the second half like it it was it was different but I I can see where the dislike comes from like she did have an attitude towards the to Blyleth the, the yeah it was a, it was a little bit more of a friendly competition I guess between them in the second half right when you get to her A level it's more like like yeah okay like we we were both you know connected to Geralt but um Geralt Gerald it's a harder soft G I don't remember. Um, but the idea is that, yeah, she, okay, we, maybe we can be, we can be equals or we can keep, keep fighting to see who's going to be the best. We can push each other, I guess, is something yeah. uh, that came out of that. But yeah, I, I can't hate her too much because I think, <laughs> uh, she was just so powerful on my team that, uh, I, I rely on her a fair bit. Uh, the next two I'm, I'm going to lump together because for me personally, like they, they, they worked, they were just kind of like a, a duo. And that's uh, Raphael and Ignat Ig Ignat Ignat oh, yeah Ignat, um, and they had uh, their stories were intertwined because uh, Raphael's parents were killed in, in um, what ends up being like a a conspiracy, I guess. Hmm. And uh, I Ignat's parents were supposed to be the ones uh, that were on this. Uh, trade mission i guess it, it yeah would something be like considered. that yeah. yeah and Raphael's parents ended up uh, replacing him and so the their relationship was uh ignatz was like very uh standoffish with Raphael because of that history and mm -hmm. Raphael was just like 
oh whatever there was a it, it, there was this running theme in Fire Emblem through many of the characters where it was they had a very attitude of um, you know we can't repeat the mistakes of our parents or else we'll never grow and Raphael's story really uh, exemplified that mm-hmm. I don't know if I bought it entirely though right like he kind of he kind of he seems so willing to forgive or, or get over that or look past it I guess it makes sense with like he's so focused on his sister and training and trying to you know, support her and take care of her that he can't he can't worry about what happened to his parents or he can't let that be something that drags him down I, I guess I kind of get that but I, I would have liked to see a little bit more emotion from him like I felt like he was every time you saw him he was super positive and you know grunting and doing you know working out and eating and it just there was no kind of sadness there's nothing I would like to see a little bit more emotion from him on the negative side I guess it's some, just to give him a little bit more complete you know uh, perspective something particular about Raphael is that a lot of these characters they are people that are going through arcs on screen in front of us Raphael mm-hmm. went through his arc off screen before the game started yeah yeah that's um true. and he didn't really work for me um i yeah. think his archetype of like you know the big guy that likes meat and punching and everything i just i didn't care for him i know a lot of people love him he's just a particular archetype that i don't like and i think mm-hmm. that the fact that his his arc happens before the game starts kind of hurts him a bit yeah, yeah I, agree. I think i think he had the teddy bear effect yeah Ignatz, I don't really have an opinion right. on because all of his supports are just like, I like painting, but my dad doesn't want me yeah. to paint. But <laughs> yeah, kind of a flat character. But by God, he's a yeah. good archer. Holy shit. Yeah. Yeah. yeah very powerful sniper for sure. Yeah. And then next up is uh, Lorenz, who um, he comes off as a creep in the in the beginning. Like he's mm-hmm. uh, on the on the hunt for uh, a, a mate, I guess, to uh, because he thinks he's going to be leading the the alliance one day um and Lorenz's dad is an asshole like just flat out asshole mm-hmm. he's he's the one who set up uh Raphael's parents that ended up dying and he's he uh, was one of the first to move over to the empire when they started taking over like he is he's a he's just a class a asshole and it's funny that Lorenz is kind of an and he, he didn't doesn't really agree with what his dad does but at the same time is not like vocally against until really the second half when he starts to realize like the damage that that his dad really is causing but it was another character that it was like yeah he's just like i, I didn't focus on him too much uh there's in, in my second playthrough i actually see him a lot more because uh, i didn't realize how much of a relationship he develops with ferdinand i yeah i, I... Go, go ahead, Matt. I'll, I'll go last. I like Lawrence a lot, to be honest. Um, I had a minor existential crisis because I had only ever seen his name written out until my Golden Deer playthrough started. So I was saying Lorenz, and then he calls himself Lorenz 110 hours into this video game. Um, <laughs> but when you see him in the other houses, all you ever see of him is him saying genuinely, like, genuinely good things about the nobility's role of making lives better for the common people. And I thought that was really good. And I liked him a lot in my Black Eagles and Blue Lions playthrough and could not understand why you guys didn't like him. And I still (laughs) like him, but I understand. I understand now. I get it. I liked him by the end. He, he yeah, was just, I liked him by he the He was a little answer. pricklish. He was a little p- pricklish at the beginning. Of He's also, but he, uh, I missed this in my voice actors earlier. He's voiced by Benjamin Diskin, who uh, was number one in Kids Next Door, and Joseph mm-hmm. Joe Star in JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. That's really important to me. I, what I what I like about him is that. Yeah, he starts off as it seems like he's just kind of like a womanizer, and he's just on the prowl, you know, looking yeah, looking for someone to marry. But by the end, like everyone kind of understands that he's, you know, they feel like he's got this kind of leadership role with the team in the second half of the game. Like everyone comes back and he's kind of um, out there for the greater good. And, you know, he's going to, he's going to make sure that everything's kind of okay and protect everybody. Like, I think he does become someone who is pretty respectable and, you know, has everyone's best interests at heart by the end of it. I think you, you he kind of, convinced me of that i suppose like yes he's got he's worried about like leading the alliance and and still finding a partner but he's also like hey like these are all my friends i care about these people um i'm I'm gonna i'm gonna do my best for them i'm gonna i'm gonna stand by them 
next up, we have my most uh, powerful wizard, uh, Lysithia. Lysithia, I recruited on all playthroughs. She is... Wow. Everyone should. She's, She's so wonderful. powerful. She's so strong. Yeah, yeah and it uh, might be because of the dual crest that she had. I, I think it was... They had her story was that the it was the night crawlers that were experimenting yeah right? okay mm-hmm. so it's mm-hmm. really interesting lysithia fits really well into the black eagles playthrough because the the experimentation that the night crawlers did on her was all like prototyping for what they would eventually do to edelgard and it's something that they bond over lysithia has a, a full support a full series of support conversations with edelgard and it's just another part of how I am convinced that Fire Emblem Three Houses is just a ripoff of Fate Stay Night. Now that I am a recent fan of Fate Stay Night, because this is just Crest Worms. I hate it. <laughs> but yeah, I love Lysa. Well, I set her up with. Uh, I ended up setting her up with Hanuman so that he could uh, remove one of the crests. Linhart also does that, and I think it's a little less creepy. What's yeah. the What's the ben- oh, That's just one of the support conversations that. Happens. Well, that's so, that's the paired end. Yeah, like. Have. Yeah, oh, I, gotcha, don't, gotcha, yeah gotcha, I don't even, okay. yeah, I was going to say, I don't even think it was in the support conversation because mm-hmm. I think it was in like the, the ending where they're like, just oh, happens in left, the ending. yeah, Lysithia bonded with Hanuman and when he died, took over uh, as Chris Caller. And I'm like, mm-hmm. oh, okay. Okay. Great. Yeah. I, I, what I, just because we're on the topic of a mage, like I, I really like the way magic works in this game that you kind of learn spells as your skill level goes up with, with, a, with dark or light magic. Right. Um, and that it kind of re it, you have a limited number of uses, but it refreshes after every battle. Uh, I would love to see that format continue through the Fire Emblem series. That was definitely my favorite use of magic that I've seen. Yeah. Well, and another uh, magic user, uh, Marianne, uh, she she had a was another interesting storyline. Uh, her crest was uh, the for, a forsaken crest. Um. That gave her. I'm. I, I believe. I don't know if they've just flat out said it or not, but. It let her communicate with animals. I think they. I think they do say that. I think she. Ex, I feel like she might explain that to Raphael or something. Yeah, her like that. her support with Raphael and is her... all about like Raphael wanting to talk to a bird, and like she doesn't actually yeah. talk to them. She just kind of gets them. No. Yeah. yeah. Well, in her her final prologue, um, I, I to me was actually the hardest map because I wasn't paying it like i was trying to get rid of all the divine beasts before going after the final guy and it didn't occur to me that he was calling in more (laughs) divine beasts (laughs) yeah yeah (laughs) so i'm like man i've killed like 20 of these when are they going to stop and then i realized oh when he's doing that call thing he's bringing more in marianne is another unit that i had on all three routes because i made her my dancer in my black eagles and blue lions playthrough Hmm. um and she's a pretty good dancer in all honesty but she was she was a healer for me like a, 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 on a, a, on horseback as well and yeah I, I just I, I found her very useful for you know just kind of topping people up when I needed it but by by the end of the game you know I wasn't really healing that much I, so first first part of the game she was helpful for me I do kind of feel like uh, Marianne's in... character runs a little thin uh, I yeah. at first yeah. I found her relatable just... because she hates herself much like I do um, but eventually it's just like well okay you don't want to be around anyone because you bring bad luck okay i get it is there any support conversation you have that isn't about that yeah, yeah. they were all they're all kind of really similar that i think i saw yeah. a couple of them through and i'm like oh i kind of see where this is going i'm probably not going to go all the way to, to a rank with or b rank with some characters because it's just going to be the same thing right i did want to i did want to point out one thing about golden deer i was gonna i was thinking i was tempted to write a feature about it but uh i i don't have time with packs coming up this weekend um the the names for uh specifically the last names for characters in golden deer uh half of them are taken from king lear shakespeare's king lear um regan gone regan which is Claude's uh Claude's last name uh goneril which is hilda's last name and Lysithia's last name is Ordelia, uh, which is very close to Cordelia. Those are the three daughters of King Lear in the play. Um, Edmund and Gloucester uh, are the na- last names of Marianne and uh, Lorenz, uh, respectively. Those are also characters from King Lear. So you have five characters in the Golden Deer house 
whose uh, last names are directly related or probably taken from King Lear. I think it's too much of a coincidence to be uh, to be yeah, to be that. I think uh, there was clearly some. Uh, uh, motivation there but uh, I was trying to look at deeper and I couldn't find anything like I don't think the story I don't know that the behavior of the characters really relates to King Lear I think it might just be a naming thing that that, that happened maybe with uh, uh, the treehouse uh, someone uh, maybe a Shakespearean there or, uh, an English major like myself uh, wanted to take some names from one of their favorite plays so uh, just a cool thing that I noticed uh, going through those names and thinking about some of the plays that I'd read uh, when that I was is really interesting and yeah, I yeah. I, I wish there was more. I wish I wish that there was something in the support conversations or the story of the game that related to King Lear, but I can't, you know, I've done a little bit of thinking about it and I can't come up with something yet, so. Uh, I think that anyone that is interested in uh, Fire Emblem characters having names from, like, history and mythology should check out my, my mm-hmm. featured article that is hopefully on the site by the time you guys hear this about how Fire Emblem accidental, accidentally created a fake piece of Norse mythology. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. That uh, I didn't even know you're working on the map, Matt. That sounds like mm-hmm. I like posted it one. in the in the server. Someone someone edited it. Ah, very good. Okay. Yeah, cool. I think we're gonna have to rely on Matt for the next section because uh, I don't have a whole lot of <laughs> interaction with. Yeah, these this folks, is gonna be really. This is gonna be this, really rapid well, fire. So good. <laughs> yeah, I, this I don't is, know a lot of characters. The blue lion. So, um, you talked a little bit about Dimitri, but if there's anything else you wanted to Dimitri Alexandra Matt. Blathed, uh. At least sometimes his last name is pronounced Blathed. The voice actors actually don't agree on how it's pronounced. <laughs> but mm. uh, yeah, Dimitri's like one of my favorite characters in the entire Fire Emblem franchise. I love him so much. He's so good. Uh, did you? And then, oh, I'm sorry. Did you have yep. his second? Oh, no, go ahead. Uh, did you the second? His, that's, again, the other character, the, the Blue Lions character that you can't um, recruit unless you're yes, on the Blue uh, Lions. Did you is internalized racism the character. Uh, the, tra- <laughs> the the tragedy of Dusker is a very important thing in the backstory for the Blue Lions, and uh, Didu is from Dusker, so he it, he kind of buys into like you know people people treat him really badly because he's from Dusker, and like mm. what he says to you to to Byleth is you know you you shouldn't hang around me. Uh, I'm from Dusker. People will start to get the wrong idea, and. Dudu is a solid character, and also his defense is so high it's impossible to do damage with him. Do damage to him with anything but magic. Like, wow, he's a really good defensive unit. And then uh, Annette, I I've started a storyline where it's pretty obvious that she's the daughter. Yes, of Gilbert. Gilbert is very obviously her father. Um, and when you play the Blue Lions yeah. route and you recruit Gilbert, it doesn't even pretend otherwise. And I honestly really liked the stuff that was going on with Annette and Gilbert. Uh, I'm surprised how much I did. Um, Gilbert is kind of like the um, he's the, the, the tactical second in command for the Blue Lions route um, for, for spoiler reasons that I won't get into too much because it's not important and I do want you guys to play this route. It's really good. Um, but Gilbert is kind of, is as far as like executive structure goes, he's the second in command of the army in blue lions. And so the blue lions route takes the opportunity to have things going on between Gilbert and Annette. And I just like what's going on with them. I think it's a good story. I like it. And Annette reminds me of Anne of green Gables, which is an important book series to me and my friends, which was made into an anime in the 1970s, which is just important to me. Annette is Annette is Anne of green Gables. And that and uh, Anne of Green Gables is uh, as Canadian yes. as it gets. Is that why her name is? Annette? I don't know, but I like uh, Anne of Green Gables is really big in Japan, like surprisingly mm-hmm. so. But I, I'm not. I was not joking. They made an anime series out of it. Oh no, I've I've actually seen it because <laughs> my well, my <laughs> wife is a big Anne of Green Gables fan. So, <laughs> um, next up we got Ash. Um, so there, I know there is the stuff with Lenato. But it did. I didn't feel like, like it teased it, and then yeah, just kind of so, dropped it. Um, Ash's character is very conflicted by. Um, so Ash is a commoner that was adopted by Lenato, who is who is a lo- who is a noble, um, and he he has a lot of like internal, like a lack of self worth because of that. 
uh, he he grew up like literally having to steal food to survive, and now he's like he's in a rich family. He's at the officers' academy, and I feel like they don't do enough with his character to really feel like something that that moves forward or progresses in any way. But I still do like the concept that they've set up. Um, and he's a good archer. And uh, another character that I, I didn't really see much screen time on was Mercedes. Uh, Mercedes, which I can't, it's pronounced Mercedes, and I cannot believe that. <laughs> um, <Okay. laughs> Mercedes learns fortify. That's a really good spell. I hate, I, I hate her. She's <laughs> terrible. That's it. Okay. That's, that's all. Okay, so Mercedes <laughs> yeah. and Annette are best friends from childhood or whatever. And then their B support is about, like, Annette being like, hey, you want to go shopping? Oh, I can, you know. Uh, I, I, I can help you, like, pick out stuff and everything. And then Mercedes is like, oh, you just think I can't do anything by myself. You treat me like a child. And she storms off and they break up. I hate Mercedes. <laughs> I'm I'm glad I didn't bother with that one then. Um, another one that I was I, I was not all that interested in was uh, Sylvain. Yeah. I, I, I get what you're saying with, like, the um so i mean you end up sylvan's brother is part of the main story um where the non-crest guy tries to take one of the relics and uh, it ends up turning him into a beast Mm -hmm. and i understand why sylvan is um has some doubts about the crests and the nobility and that sort of thing i just don't buy that like the the whole oh well i treat women badly because they only care care about my crest and i'm like hmm yeah, I, I, I'm not buying that. Like, that might be your excuse, but that's poor uh, excuse. He is a character that is not self-actualized. He genuinely believes that, and he's wrong. Um, that's something that he he comes to recognize over the course of his supports, definitely. But uh, I I think he's he's interesting in the terms of like. He, he's someone that is wrong but he's not a bad person he's just misguided um and i ended up liking his character a lot which is a good thing because he got terrible growths in both of my playthroughs where i used him so he was just a garbage unit um but i did make sure in my black eagles playthrough that he got the last hit on the final boss because he was the only person in my army that joined me not through circumstance or not through me courting them but because he wanted to be a part of my group right from minute one because when you because when you play as female byleth he joins you immediately <laughs> yeah i was just gonna say yeah exactly <laughs> for for all the wrong reasons he wanted to be there day one is he the only character that, yes. that's like that uh whether, whether you play and, yeah. and is there a character like that if you play male no. byleth oh, okay interesting uh now, Felix, I actually did use because he was my most powerful sword user. Uh, Felix is incredible. Or one of them, like, anyway. Straight up, he's awesome. Yeah. Uh, he's directly integrated into the main story of Blue Lions. He is so, so well written. And he is one of those characters. Um, Seren's talked about this uh, on Twitter and like on RFN and everything. There are some characters whose paired endings are like blatantly gay, but they're not gay options for the romances. Felix and Sylvain their paired ending with each other is that they die on the same day because they can't, they can't live in a world without each other. Oh, that's funny. I never, uh, they, I never saw any of their interactions. There's a, there's a lot more between them, like in the blue lions route, obviously. Matt is the implication that they kill themselves, that they commit suicide <laughs> I don't together. I think so, but maybe. <laughs> okay. Well, I was just looking for another Shakespeare reference there is all. <laughs> and then the final the blue Romeo lion and is Juliet of blue lions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and the, the final blue line, uh, another um, another non favorite for Matt is Ingrid. Tell you a story <laughs> about the tragedy of Dusker. So the tragedy of Dusker is when uh, the Dimitri's father, the king of uh, the king of Fargus, was murdered, and uh, it is widely believed that the people of Dusker were responsible. Assassins from Dusker who wanted to over- to stage a coup and overcome and yeah, and overthrow Fargus. Uh, as a response to this, the officials of the kingdom literally salted the earth in Dusker and absorbed them into the kingdom. Uh, Dadu, of course, was directly impacted by this. Many people in Dusker died. And Dimitri is of the opinion that maybe literally salting the earth of Dusker was going a little far. 
One of the first things that Ingrid ever says when you talk to her in the monastery, her saying that she cannot believe that Dimitri is taking Dusker's side. Now, in <laughs> fairness, oh, Ingrid's fiancé was killed in the tragedy of Dusker. But when you say that Dimitri thinking maybe literally salting the earth was going too far is sympathizing with the, these clear villains, you're racist. Sorry, Ingrid. You're racist. <laughs> and also her voice acting is kind of bad. And, uh, well, so you yeah. didn't, you didn't friend ask Frank did. with her, Matt? No, like, I, I, have, I have a friend <laughs> who asked Frank with Ingrid in his Black Eagles playthrough. And yeah. uh, Ingrid's racism actually never comes up if you if you recruit her in another route. It's literally it's literally just oh, in her really? interactions okay. with to do. And if you talk to her on the Blue Lions route, so he actually mm. s ranked her without realizing that she was racist. And like we we, we make jokes mm. about it all the time. And he he plays into the bit, yeah. <laughs> like he like every time we bring it up as a joke, he's he like talks about how the people of Dusker deserved it. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> uh, and, you got to stand yeah. by your partner, right? So, yeah. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> All right, and we'll wrap up uh, the podcast with a breakdown of the Black Eagles. So we'll start with. Uh, I've Edelgard. already talked about how I love Edelgard, so, so instead she... I'm going to bring up a fun fact yeah. that uh, Hressvelger is um, it's a mythological beast that uh, it is basically mm-hmm. like a vulture that literally eats corpses. So in pre-release, we called her Edge Lord von Corpse Eater. I love her. She's my wife. Uh, and then uh, Bernadetta, who spends uh, most of the first half hiding in her room. I'm kind of. At least that's 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 all I'm I really saw during my golden. Year. She becomes really good in part two, like actually like a fully realized character. But she's the most Fate's Awakening character, and when I say that, what I mean is like a lot of the characters mm-hmm. in Fate's and Awakening, they're very based on their gimmicks. They have a single gimmicky thing that defines them and that's about it excuse me i'm yeah, yeah i was she, definitely bernadetta more than any other yeah. character in the cast that's bernadetta i i liked that... her i wanted her to come out of her room and spend more time with us but i wasn't prepared to like bend over backwards to make it happen um i i yeah i, I hoped to recruit her i kept talking to her and giving her i gave her gifts from time to time but yeah i wasn't you know I didn't want to push that hard, I guess. If it, if it happened, it happened. I, I did but. legit get a little emotional mm-hmm. after, like, the, Geralt dies and she, like, comes out of her room to, like, pay her respects and everything. Yeah, and th- yeah, that was a good bit. Her voice acting's yeah. really good. Um, I may not like mm-hmm. her, like, weird gimmicky stuff with her character, but her voice actor sells it. Yeah. And from what I've seen of Casper, he uh, was kind of one dimensional is, as but he well. Was, he, like if you build him as like a punch boy, he becomes one of your best units. Like he he punches anything. Yeah. And by the way, uh, I I also made Dimitri a punch boy, which is the best way to make Dimitri. <laughs> but just literally punch eight of our death. <laughs> I, I I like that it I like that it took us two hours and fifteen minutes of the podcast for you to say punch Look, boy. Look, okay, okay, I I cannot believe. I- <laughs> <laughs> I've never I heard that believe expression. I forgot to bring this up, but adding the brawler class and like the gauntlet weapons, I love that. Wow! I yeah, me too. I cannot I like believe I forgot to bring like that up in the gameplay it's, section. It's, it's actually change. incredible. I'm going to change the orders a little bit here, so my two favorite Black Eagles are, are last. Uh, I'm going to jump down to Hubert. So he's the second in command for Black Eagles, and is uh, another person that you cannot uh, recruit unless you're so in Hubert, the Black Eagles. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. And he, he, he looks like a vampire. <laughs> so Hubert is, is like, kind of blatantly evil. You're totally right. But he's really well written. Like, yeah. his writing is incredible. His voice acting is on point. If you've, ev- if you've played Shadows of Lentia, he has the same voice actor as Tobin. Like, that's in- like that dude has range. His, vo- like, his voice actor is incredible. His writing's incredible. Yeah, he's an evil piece of shit. But by God, he's a great evil piece of shit. I love the, uh, I think it was the B rank with Byleth, where he's, like, going through the different ways that he w- he's going to kill her. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, it's like, yeah. It's like, I could poison you in your sleep, or, or you could, I could do this. 
But hopefully I won't need to do I, that. I really do like Hubert. <laughs> he is uh, an atrocious human being, but there's a there's a difference between a good human yeah. being and a good and a good character. And Hubert is an incredible character. Yeah. Uh, I might lump Ferdinand and Linhart together because they both kind of had a gimmick too. Ferdinand, uh, his gimmick was is that he was always he in competition Ferdinand with Adelbert. And <laughs> yeah, and then Linhart was uh, always. Linhart's actually to one sleep. of my favorite characters because he's extremely relatable. <laughs> he just like he just shows up <laughs> and he's just like, yeah, I don't want to talk to you. Like, he, he actually has a support conversation with yep. Ferdinand, where, like, Ferdinand says hi to him, and he just turns around and walks away. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I love I, I love Linhart. Yeah. Oh, I like the one where, uh, with Petra, where he's, like, telling Petra how to do it properly, and Petra's like, well, it'd be easier if you just showed yeah. me. He's like, no, oh, I, I, I really, really love Linhart. Um, Ferdinand <laughs> feels like the same character as Lorenz, but if they didn't want to commit to it. it yeah. It's kind of weird. Yeah, I could see that. But man, his hair in after the time skip. And uh we'll we'll close on my favorite two black eagles, uh Dorothea, who is uh amazing. She she just seemed to be in the middle of everything. Even though I was doing the golden deer. I I got her early on and uh she won the dance competition uh, for so me. So Dimitri has uh, she's She's Demetri the one the I best S-ranked voice acting with in the game. Dorothea has the second best voice acting in the game. Hmm. Like I'm actually astonished how good her voice acting is. And she had great support uh, conversations. Like I think it was uh Ferdinand, I think. She was having fun with where she was like I hate you and he was trying I... to figure out why. Their and B support being very actually coy. convinced me that I <laughs> kind of really do like Ferdinand as a character even though like I kind of just dunked on him as a worse Lorenz. But, like, he, like, the way that he kind of goes into, like, like, he's very self-aware in all of that. I, and, like, he acknowledged legitimate shortcomings that he had and tried to address them. Uh, And Dorothea herself is very, a a, a very self-actualized character. I, I really liked what was going on with her. And I really, really liked the contrast between her and part one, where, you know, she's kind of like a little bragging about like, oh, man, it feels good to win. And then part two, she's just like, well, I guess this is what victory is in war. Yeah. Dorothea has a really good uh, interactions with Lawrence as well, where uh, she's kind of putting him in his place, you know, like, oh, you know. Uh, I, I, I'm not, I'm not good enough for you. Like, don't talk to me. Like, yeah, I'm not, I'm not high born. Like she kind of, uh, I guess very strong or kind of in his face, I suppose. Like, I, I like, I like that she kind of immediately stood up to him. I think that's what happens in one of their first conversations. It's very much like, I'm not going to let you, you know, kind of, you know, look at me as lower, lower class than you, or that, you know, that I don't, I don't belong, you know, in a conversation with you or something like that. I, I, I did, I like that aspect of her character. And we'll finish up with uh, probably it, she might be my favorite uh, character. Uh, it's between her and Shamir for sure. But mm-hmm. Petra, uh, the princess from. So I uh, also Bridget. recruited Petra on every route because, wow, her personal skill of like gaining 50 percent crit rate when an enemy is under uh, or no double crit rate when an enemy is under 50 percent health. Wow, that's good. Mm-hmm. And also, why doesn't her voice yep. actress have an accent? <laughs> like it's super weird yeah speaking speaking of that accent um i you know i i teach english for a living right and so i'm i'm looking at the kind of i'm probably one of the few people looking at the the grammar and the vocabulary mistakes she's making and trying to figure out like oh uh, is this is, is this natural is this something that i've encountered from you know teaching teaching students of different different ethnic backgrounds different native languages right like who would make these kind of mistakes and the mistakes she was making, I couldn't really place them. I couldn't really fit, like, or think about what the localizers were trying to go for there. Um, they weren't the types of mistakes I've ever I've ever encountered. They felt like maybe a little bit unnatural. It, she didn't seem like someone learning English, but more, oh, let's just replace these words with words I... that are wrong, right? Like she kept adding ne- she kept adding ness to everything, like hardness or softness or easiness or something like that. And she would use them in, in, in a con in a context or in a way that I've never encountered before in, in years of teaching and tutoring English. So 
that uh, I guess it was interesting to me just to kind of like try to decipher each of her conversations and figure out like what what are the what are the writers actually going for here? What were what were they what were they thinking when they were I, writing I her dialogue? I think they wanted to avoid making her an analog for any particular real world ethnicity. Uh, and I, hmm. I can understand that. But the consequence is that you make something that feels inauthentic and it kind of s- yeah, it kind of yeah, sucks because her I voice actress uh, Faye Mata, she is mm-hmm. she is in the English dub of the anime series Konosuba, where she plays the character of Aqua, and okay. that is one of the best English mm-hmm. dubs of an anime I've ever heard in my life, and she is incredible in that. So it's like she goes from like one of the greatest voice acting roles of all time to kind of a half-assed character in Petra. And I loved Petra. I loved her writing. Mm. I loved her in gameplay. But her voice acting felt really hollow because she had a perfect, mm. I, I guess you could call it a Fodlin accent. Uh, she's like, her voice sounded perfect, just written weird. Yeah. Yeah, I guess that's the danger of a character that you're you're trying to play off as not a native speaker of the language or not native to the country where the game is taking place, that it's not necessarily going to work out or it's not going to seem real if you aren't very careful with uh, how, how the character is voiced, how the character is written. Uh, the, yeah, I don't know. I, I get what you're saying, Matt, like not, not choosing a specific uh, language instead of like errors that maybe would be typical to uh, a, a Chinese learner of English or a Japanese one or something like that. But yeah, I, I think, it, I think the inauthenticity turned me off of her i liked her a lot and i i, I wanted to keep talking to her to see see, see her growth and I, I you do see growth in her language actually which is really cool from the first half to the second half of the game she becomes a better user of english and i thought that was really really neat that they kept up with that part of the story so kudos to the writing team for doing that element i kind of sure. i kind of felt like in part two she she, like, she didn't have any progress on learning the the language of Fodlin. Mm-hmm. we we could say it's english but like since this is a game written in Japanese and translated in English, it's the language of Fodlin. Mm-hmm, but it's mm-hmm. like, I understand Fair. that they couldn't do anything about that because then they would have to rewrite her supports that could either happen in part one or part two. But it's also just like in five mm-hmm. years, she didn't get like even the slightest bit better at the language. Yeah, yeah. She's That's too true. busy slicing up. But I did, I did love her a lot. Uh, I loved her from a gameplay perspective. I loved her from a story perspective. Uh, I thought it was kind of weird when I recruited her in the other routes and realized, oh, her whole point here is that she's kind of being held hostage by the Empire as a political hostage. So I'm probably leading, <laughs> like, probably weird. recruiting her into the the army of the Holy Kingdom of Fargus is going to lead to all of Bridget being genocided by the Empire. Oops. Uh, necessary. Uh, if we want to go over the like the other character, like the the professors and the people of the church, I do have them in front of me. Uh, well, yeah, the first one ahead. that I have is Sedith. I love Sedith. I think Sedith is great. Yeah, I I didn't. I I was trying to focus in on my second playthrough, but I have because I didn't really get too far. And I like I, I think I might have a ranked, but I don't recall what it was. <laughs> he was just kind of like a in the background for me. I I, I think. Yeah, I just I just saw him as like oh Sothis is. Uh, father He's, right uh, flane's or father father not big brother a uh, flane 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 yeah. sorry yeah yeah um I, yeah I, I i couldn't shake the fact that like that that's that's the relationship that i was focusing on or that that was the one that thing that i noticed the most like i yeah the professors like i i i have recruited a bunch of them but i don't know that i really got all that attached to anyone that wasn't manuela or shamir like that that was kind of mm. that kind of was kind of it for me uh, um I've also got, uh, we've got Rhea, obviously. Um, you know, I, mm-hmm. I said earlier, uh, no one in this game is 100% good, and no one in this game is 100% bad. Uh, but Rhea, to me, is like 60% bad, 40% good. <laughs> she is like surprisingly effective as a yeah. villain in the Black Eagles route. Uh, and it's like, she literally like sets a city on fire and says, "Forget the civilians. As long as we make it inconvenient for Edelgard to get to me, it's worth it." So, uh... yeah, I mean, when you look, when the fact that she's Saros and that her entire family was butchered, and the P- 
people around here are walking around with the she bones is definitely of family. a character that has sympath that has a lot of sympathetic aspects going for her and that's why i say no one is 100 percent bad and, in this story raya is not 100 percent bad and it was funny watching like when i f- first saw the opening scene uh it, it, there was obviously zero context there was just a battle scene and then just to actually watch it after the fact when i knew what what the sort of the creator was <laughs> i was like oh this this has more emotional p- impact mm-hmm. now that i know what's actually going kind of weird that that uh, that opening scene is in all four routes when it's only explained in one of them that's right <laughs> it is pretty weird ray is interesting because she's a character that you're gonna probably see very differently depending on which which route you play or which routes you've played, right? You're going to learn more about her or maybe... <laughs> or not. Or, or not, yeah, exactly. And yeah. so you, you see her as more good or more bad dependent, it's right? If you've played all yeah. four, you probably have a pretty so accurate Golden picture. Golden Deer and Silver Snow handle her more or less identically. But so in Black Eagles, she is the main antagonist. Um, it's like she retreats to the Holy Kingdom of Fargus and, and gets shelter from them. In the Blue Lions route, she never appears again after the time skip. Which is super weird. It's not surprising. Um, but also, it's like super weird that part one like lays on the foreshadowing that maybe she's evil kind of thick. And then like in Golden Deer and Blue Lions, you're just kind of expected to go with it and be like, no, there's all that foreshadowing didn't matter. She's good. Don't worry about it. It kind of really put me yeah. off. Yeah, the diff it was it was a one eighty for sure and golden like going through the golden deer, it's like all of a sudden it's like everything all the evil things or all the concerns you may have had should go away yeah, because she's actually really the good guys. I think it's too because of the contrast with like they really go out of their way to make the night crawlers pure evil and and she is like the Mm -hmm. the opposite of them Mm -hmm. like that's how you're but you don't see that in the first half because the the night crawlers are just not ever really around uh the the next uh church character that i have is gilbert um which you guys since you didn't play blue lions you really didn't see any of him yeah his his whole story is is really more or less the story of him and annette uh he is not really in any of the routes besides blue lions so He's whatever. Uh, I liked him a lot, but I can't expect you guys to have any opinion on him at all. Uh, next time. <laughs> That's the same with Catherine, too, right? That she's only, if you're doing, because I, I saw a lot of Catherine in the Golden well, Deer. We, yeah, yeah, that's right. But it's be, it's only because you, we can go over you're to going to Catherine church, right? next, where it's like, it's actually interesting, because in Black Eagles, she's kind of a recurring villain. You fight her a few times. And I got really attached to her as a villain, in a way. Uh, which made me inherently distrust her in my other playthroughs. <laughs> that makes sense, because like you, you, she mm-hmm. foreshadows that if you're against the church, you're yeah, against. Yeah, I never so. really trusted her in my other routes, but I did really like her as this opposing force. And in mm-hmm. there was a there's a quest or something that happens in in Golden Deer where you kind of choose between uh helping her oh, that's helping in all shamir. of them and after i yeah. helped it's in all of them okay so uh, after i helped shamir i was like ah, oh, yeah okay i'm not gonna talk to i recruited catherine <laughs> i'm all i'm all shim- I, all in on shamir now <laughs> i recruited that was a, that was catherine an and i gave thunderbrand yeah. to someone else <laughs> yeah <laughs> nice. that's uh, a good Manu- choice, yeah. I, I did recruit her eventually yeah. but manuela is out. another uh church affiliate character yeah, I, I like Manuel a lot. I think she's she's kind of she's kind of cute and charming, and I, I liked having tea with her and her conversations. And you know, it's cute when she's kind of like clumsy or falling over, or you know, well, always you know complaining to you about guys not calling her back. You know, I I thought I thought she was kind of funny. I, yeah, I liked she was. I was surprised at how much at how much fun I had with her. Although I hated yeah, that yeah, prologue, that paralogue with Hanneman and Manuela, where like she, you had to rescue her. That was terrible. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yes, yes, yeah. That was uh, speaking of cool. Hanneman, yeah. he's kind of a creep, <laughs> but that's a, but he's yeah. voiced by Dan Warren, the creep, the creep character voice actor. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't spend a lot of time with him. Like I, I, I think I, I'm sure I recruited him at some point, and like I, I remember talking to him about the crest stuff. But after that got kind of sorted out, I don't, I don't think I spent a lot of time 
hanging around with him. Yeah, he was, he was very one dimensional with the, yeah. the crest scholar. Yeah, I just wasn't interested in learning more about that stuff and, and him talking to everyone about yeah, it. It's like, ah, okay, he was boring. I get it. Uh, we've also got Shamir. Shamir's just cool. Like she's 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 a cool person. I want around. Like I want to. She's she's kind of she's kind of dark and brooding. But uh, there's one. I think it might be with with Claude or with Lonnie um, where they're training and she like throws a dagger and she's like, oh, you know, you almost hit me with that. It's like, oh yeah, no, I killed this poisonous spider or poisonous bug yeah, that was gonna was gonna bite that's you. Super cool. I'm like, oh yeah, yeah. she's so. I think cool. that was Claude. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's just she's just yeah, really neat character. I like. I liked her kind of like style, I guess, or her flair. Yeah, and she was tremendously powerful. Yes, at yes. least in my playthroughs. Yeah, she was in mine too. Uh, the next uh, church affiliated character is uh, Flame, who uh, actually leaves your party in Crimson Flower, which uh, is unfortunate because most people that most of my friends that played Crimson Flower made them made Flame hurt their dancer. <laughs> uh. Yeah, I didn't really use her. I I had her as a healer, but then I, but in my first playthrough, uh, I'm trying to remember who the healer was. I think it was Marianne. And then in my second playthrough, I've been using Linhart as my healer, so I haven't really found a use for her myself. Yeah, she was a second healer for me as well, and I didn't. I, when Marianne got more powerful, I didn't need Flane anymore. Um, the support conversation that jumps out to me is the one with Raphael where uh, he's kind of teaching that was her funny. To, to shout. I right? like that, is that a lot. Is that the right one? Yeah, that, that was funny. It's kind of cute. I they... like that one. I like the one she had with Felix where where she comes up to Felix and like, oh, that sword looks pretty sharp. How about you cut uh, some wood? <laughs> and she, and she throws firewood at him. foreshadowing that she's actually like a thousand years old really thick. Like, one of her lost items yeah. is an ancient map of Fodlin that's long since outdated. And it's like, hello, fellow kids. <laughs> okay. Well, you gotta have you gotta have a few of those characters in every fire. Do you guys know her deal? Do you want me to do no. you want me to tell you? Yeah, go for it. Yeah. We're, we're yeah. spoiling the so character. We're talking about the characters saints. here. Yep. Yeah. So oh, the yeah. I, Sedith and, yeah, Sedith and she's Plane one of the yeah. are I'm, Linhard. two of the four saints. Mm. Uh, Sedith is actually Keyhole, and uh, Flane is Sethleen. Uh, and actually, uh, at one point, mm. uh, if you talk to Sedith near the, the saint statues, uh, he's like, yeah, these, these are the saints. Uh, I have a particular fondness for Saint Sethleen, because you know, Sethleen is his daughter. Uh, and Seth, right. uh, Sedith yep. has a major crest of Keyhole, Flane has a major set, major crest of Sethleen, because that's their real identities. Mm. And then you actually also encounter Maquil and um, God, what's the other one's name? I forget the other one's name. In Paralogs, uh, I remember the Maquil Paralog was a desert map, and I hate desert maps, so I didn't do that one. Mm. Oh yeah, I remember I just, that. I guy. really yep. hate desert maps and just refuse. I, to I ended up, yeah, he was the boss that was pretty powerful, but I ended up like just having. Uh, nine people rush him at once. Yeah, and I mentioned way through. at the beginning of the podcast that I quit in that I, I hated Binding Blade. I quit at the desert map chapter, and I I literally like mm. the desert map chapter in that game. Literally, I could not beat even with action replay cheats. So, I hate <laughs> desert maps and fire emblem. Um, Linhart gave away um the Flane's identity. Where he, he came up and basically like accused without fully accusing her that he was like you have a lot of resemblance to her and then he was like being very coy on all the all the different things like sh you know this saint has this you have this actually, she has this you have this I really like it's very her odd. ending text where it's like you know in uh, in this new era she asked the man standing with her if she could call him father I thought that was cute. Uh, the next yeah. church person we, person we've got is Aloise. I kind of didn't like Aloise. I didn't like him either. Is that the uh, the guy who seems yeah. like a bumbling kind of knight? You know, he's he yeah, yeah, a little mm -hmm. more rotund and he's short. Kind of loser. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah then we've got it. Geralt, your father. I kind of feel like he's a mm -hmm. disappointment of a character. Yeah, he didn't. He they didn't really flesh him out at all. Like there was, 
He was just kind of a quiet, and and the stuff you learned about yeah. him was just through other people. Mm-hmm. The death doesn't seem that impactful because, you, I mean, he's not really around that much. You know, if there were more missions where you were fighting with him, or more maybe like side quests or forced interactions or something, but he's just kind of mm-hmm. he's just kind of there off to the side, and then he, he dies. And it's like, oh, okay. It's yeah. right. his only big it's ab- also damn it. There's never enough of time. Really bad scene. Yeah. Um, and I was talking to Neil a couple yeah, days is. ago, yeah. and Neil likes the scene because it actually, like, the, 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 they call it, I forget what they call it in this game, but it's the turn wheel in Shadows of Lentia that lets you go back in time. Uh, the Divine Pulse, that's what they mm-hmm. call it. They use that in that cutscene, and that's good. Yeah. Everything yep. else about that cutscene is bad. <laughs> yeah, I liked that part of the cutscene, that he uses it, and it's like, oh, there's this feeling, oh, he's, he's just gonna, he's gonna fix it, but then he doesn't, and I'm like, ah, that's good, they did the right thing um, there. Cyril is another church affiliated character. Ugh, yeah. I'm not, yeah, fan, I, not a fan of his. He was either. boring. Yeah, he was he was too one dimensional yeah. to me. Uh Sothis, a character that I am surprised at how much I liked. Because they didn't mm-hmm. <laughs> they didn't play into the she's actually a thousand years old, so it's okay to think she's hot. <laughs> they didn't play into that at yeah. all. And I thought her writing was really good. Cassandra Lee Morris plays her really well and I just was kind of really sad that she disappears a little under halfway through the game and never shows up again yeah I'm with you there too I I, I liked when she was kind of in the room and every time you'd start a new church day you could talk to her and maybe she'd have something to say or she's just kind of, she, you know she's kind of snappy you know like kind of talking back to you a little bit and yeah she's sassier she's got she had an edge to her that I kind of liked and I, I missed that like you said in the second half yeah, she felt very much like Morgana too, though. I think that was mm. part of the reason why. Yeah, uh, that was partial. Uh, and the final character in Fire Emblem Three Houses, Byleth, who I wrote an entire article about how Byleth is the worst player avatar in series history. Uh, By- Byleth sucks. <laughs> and I'm gonna, I'm gonna, my, uh, our our newest member of the site, Peter Spasia, he's a a personal friend of mine. Just put out the top five remaining Smash Brothers DLC character predi- predictions, where he said that Byleth would be a Robin Echo at best. Uh, someone in the YouTube comments was very offended by this. I'm gonna I'm gonna back Peter up here. Byleth sucks. Byleth is at best a a a Robin Echo. I am the one that personally advised Peter to write that into the script. Byleth sucks. The best thing they have going for them is the sword of the creator. And let's be honest, it's a cool sword, but it's not that cool. And and anyone could have used that, right? The character could have been anyone else, and they could have still had a cool weapon. I don't think that that makes the character you know worth wanting to play as or something like that. Yeah, I I, I played as a male Byleth, and I I got I just got kind of annoyed by the end when. Every time it would cut to him, it's just like him nodding or him looking stern or shaking his head. I'm like, I get that that's not necessarily the character, but a choice that the designers are making. But it didn't do any favors for me wanting to be, you know, attached to this person that I'm playing as. I cannot believe that they made a worse player avatar than Corin. Yeah. Yeah, Corn was that, probably is... the lowest for me to that point they, too, and they made a worse player avatar than Chris. <laughs> Jesus, it's 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 bad. It's uh, I don't know. I uh, that it's something I I just kind of ignored by the end. Like, oh, Byleth is my strongest character, and I'm gonna I'm gonna win the game with him. But it's not. It's not like I really care about the S rank at this point. Like I I, I that, that was one of the things that disappointed me is that because but the Byleth character is so weak that the S rank choice at the end is not that impactful or not that meaningful because i i don't i don't feel like my i don't feel like i'm byleth so the s rank doesn't really mean that much yeah that's that's bit where i felt like i just it, it i just felt like the byleth, byleth was a husk like yeah. it was just a stand-in you can check out my article for details on how i think byleth sucks <laughs> but to keep it brief uh, oh god brief that's not a reward to keep it brief, Byleth sucks. And that's yeah, everyone. So, uh, that's I every think, character. I guess, I guess yeah. that's how we're ending the Three Houses podcast. <laughs> Byleth <laughs> sucks. Yeah. I, <laughs> well, I, unless, so, if you guys I, want to do some final thoughts. Well, I yeah. just artificially extended the, the podcast by 20 minutes by saying, hey, I've also got a list of the church characters. 
characters. No, it's it's worth it's worth talking about them. But yeah, I think it is. I think it is time for final thoughts, though. Yeah, I. So I I've spent a lot of time this episode being negative about three houses, and that is mostly that is largely because my most recent experience with three houses was 30 hours of the golden deer route where i was extremely disappointed at how similar it was to the blue lions route so i was i felt really bad about it and i felt really upset and negative but there's like i can't deny that for a hundred hours of gameplay i was in love with this game and like that means a lot there are a lot of really 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 good things in this game and there's some bad things too i i can't deny that the night crawlers suck the the difficulty level sucks the fact that you have to play it four times to understand the story sucks but there's so many good things in this game edelgard dimitri claude all great characters every character in this game feels like a fully fleshed out human being which is something that i can't say about any other game in the franchise the gameplay took huge strides with the gambits, uh, gambits and being able to dismount and all of those things. It's, it's not a perfect game, but it's a really solid game. And I went into this thinking this was going to be one of the worst, uh, one of the worst Fire Emblem games ever made. Uh, I, Jordan, I don't think we, you and me did that deep dive that I don't think ever got posted, but, but like uh, you, you remember I was really negative about the game. Yeah. But, I, I think we, we we thought we saw we we had hopes for it right we saw a lot of potential maybe yeah but uh, I I didn't think it was gonna live up to me to any of that potential and I'm very very happy to say that I was wrong there are some things that I was concerned about that I ended up being right to be concerned about I think a lot of the school stuff ended up hurting the game but on the whole it's a really solid fire emblem game to me it's not the best fire emblem it's far from perfect, but it's solid, and I'm satisfied. I, I, There are things that I wish I could change. There are things that I hope they never do again. There are things that I wish they didn't do. But it's a solid game, and I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful that more people are getting into Fire Emblem because of it. I hope that people go back and play the older entries, especially the Tellius games, because they're my favorite, but also even the, the Game Boy Advance games. Also even maybe some of the Japan-only games. Maybe Shadows of Valencia. Maybe even if you feel like you're really hardcore, the Jugdrill games. Or maybe if this is your first experience ever, maybe Awakening. Maybe if you feel like playing a terrible video game, maybe you play Fates. <laughs> Let's not go um, that far. But my, my main hope is that you look at this and, and if you were never into Fire Emblem before... Just maybe think, you know, maybe there's something here. Maybe there's something interesting in this, in this weird strategy RPG series with characters that are all very fleshed out, with uh, all these different weapons that you can choose from, with these fantasy settings that are all unique in their own way, with characters that, even if they're the supporting cast, the units that are expendable, they're still fleshed out human beings. Maybe there's something in this franchise um, because Fire Emblem means a lot to me. Uh, it's, you know, Path of Radiance, Radiant Dawn, emotionally, they're two of the most important video games ever played. And if this game makes you even interested in learning about what those are about, then that's all worth it for me. Um, because I don't think this is a perfect video game, but I think it's really important that if you never cared about Fire Emblem before and this gets you interested in it, then that's something really special. And for all the problems that I had with it, I'm really happy that this game got made. Um, I'm, I'm really happy that people love it. I'm really happy that people are talking about it. I'm even really happy that some people hate it because that that's something that's worth talking about that's worth discussing because fire emblem just means a lot to me and i just want it to be i want it to be something more than just this franchise that people think has too many characters in smash brothers <laughs> i want I mean... it to be i want it to be a strategy rpg series that people are interested in people want to know more about and maybe even 
a series that people go back and look at the old ones and wonder what's so special about them. I mean, I think we're, we're certainly on that track, right? Because the game seems to be selling quite well. Um, I think it has one of the strongest debuts, if not the strongest debuts for a Fire Emblem game. So hopefully we're, we're heading in that direction where more people are going to get interested in the series and we'll, we'll see remakes, we'll see new games coming out maybe more often than they have been. Um, I, I think I'm with you there, Matt. I, I do agree the game is solid. My, my thing that I'm thinking about right now or that I'm worried about right now is that when I was playing it, I was enjoying it a lot. But when I'm not playing it or since having played it, I'm I'm thinking of, that I like it less and less. Don't I don't think it's a bad game by any stretch. Um, but I think that the negatives are staying with me longer than the positives are. And so I'm very eager to replay it in a, in the coming months and see w- what happens, you know, see if the the Blue Lions playthrough at a harder difficulty really solidifies this game as one of my favorite Switch games and one of my top Fire Emblem games, or whether it's like, it's just another good game that I played in 2019 that maybe will, you know, it won't be in my top five or top 10 or anything like that. Like we, we play, you know, writing for the site, we play a lot of games. And so you, you're going to come across a lot of games that stick with you, right? And a lot of games that you forget. And I don't know which Fire Emblem is going to be. I don't know if it's going to be one that I remember a couple of years from now or if it's one that I'm like, eh, I don't really remember this Fire Emblem game that well. So we'll see what happens there. Uh, I did enjoy it a lot, but like I said, it, most of the enjoyment came in the first half of the game. I think the second half really doesn't doesn't work that well. I think it could have been tweaked a lot to make it more satisfying. And yeah, like I said, my, my biggest advice for anyone who hasn't hasn't played yet or uh, is doing another playthrough, I mean, don't don't play on normal. It's just not the right difficulty. Uh, try hard or wait for one of these newer, uh, harder difficulties that's coming soon. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm happy we got to talk about the game in detail and you know go through go through our thoughts because I think that's helped me figure out how I feel about the game, which is probably a little bit less enthusiastic and positive than I was before and during uh, the time I was playing it. Yeah, I think you guys uh, summarized my feelings on it, both both sides of the coin, <laughs> really. Like I, I do think it's uh, a fantastic game. Um, I, I don't know if it's the best game I played this year, but it's up there. But frustrated by many of the negatives, and and it's the same. I have the same feeling as Jordan, where the negatives seem to be the things that I'm remembering more as time goes on, and uh, I'm hoping that's not the case. I I've got a few games that I've got to start to focus on now, but I do plan on going back to to. Um, I'm working on the Silver Snow. T- uh, playthrough right now so I, I do intend to finish that and then when the new difficulties come in I'll probably I do the Blue Lions uh, route on the higher difficulty and um, hopefully get some enjoyment from that so uh, yeah I, I'm probably down the middle between the two of uh, I had a real good time I played 70 hours and I don't regret any of it but just frustrated by some of the decisions that were made and uh, hopefully I I think if they for the next fire emblem hopefully they'll be able to to take what was good and apply it to the new one and maybe make some adjustments to to focus more on w- what was successful with this game so and also like if they remade the jug drill games or the telius games that'd be great too <laughs> exactly i mean it's been a while since they've done a 3d fire emblem game right like when when was uh which one's the wii one matt Path of Radiance? Uh, Radiant Dawn. Radiant that was Dawn. 2007. 2007. 2008. So, it was 2007, 2008. I don't remember exactly when. It's been it was about, so it's been over a decade since they made a 3D Fire Emblem game though, right? And I, w- one, one thing that I do, and this is probably uh, true of all video tech, games. Technically I, Awakening and Fates and Shadows of Valencia were 3D, but they were 3DS games. They were not full on I mean, console the, games. But I mean, the, the combat looks so different in those games, yeah. right? Like the, the two, the 2d battlefield compared to the, the more 3d looking one. Like I, I really prefer that view and you spend so much time in the combat element of the game that, um, it didn't turn me off. And it was like, it just kind of sol- playing three hours just solidified my feeling that I, I really prefer the two, the, the more 2d or the more top down look of, uh, maybe the more sprite based or pixel based look of uh the uh, the combat in the uh, the Game Boy and the 3DS games. So, um, 
Yeah, I don't know. If it, good episode. Like, I'm glad we certainly we talked about so many elements of the game and uh, more than I I than I thought we were going to touch on. But that was great. I, I I have one last thing that I think is really important for me to say before we finish. Mm-hmm. Sure. Koei Tecmo, why can't I zoom out before the the battle starts? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That was a that was an odd choice, an odd <laughs> la- lack of a choice maybe. And that's that's, I think that's the last thing I have to say. I had my emotional diatribe on what Fire Emblem <laughs> means to me. And yeah, we're not gonna let you drink that much on the podcast next episode. Yo, this is the this is the first this is the first <laughs> podcast I've ever like had alcohol during like ever. I was not really prepared for this. No, it's <laughs> and... good. It's good. It's nice to hear like uh, like an honest kind of reflection of how you feel about a game in a series. Like that. That this is a this is a place where we can talk yeah. about games like that, right? So that's good. It's yeah, good. I, I went on a very much not sober rant for like three minutes <laughs> about Fire Emblem. <laughs> Alcohol will set you free. That's right. Boy, will it. Yeah, yeah I think the I think the Yakuza podcast is going to have to be a drunk podcast too. Okay, sure. yeah. okay. <laughs> okay. So this is a Fire Emblem podcast. I'm sorry for interrupting, but like literally in the middle of recording, they announced that Yakuza 7 is going to have turn-based RPG content. I'm, I'm, I'm writing, I'm writing a tweet about it. <laughs> As we speak, I'm, I'm about to I'm about to send that. Like th- this, this solidifies like, Yakuza as an RPG. Now. Like yeah. in in one of the breaks, we were talking about whether Yakuza counts as an RPG, and then like literally minutes later, they're like, "Yeah, Yakuza Seven's gonna have turn based RPG combat." And I'm like, "What's hilarious? The hell is it's going it's on? so hilarious. I love that though." So we're so we're we're free we're free and clear there uh, now, David. We can go for it. I am having right. an existential crisis. <laughs> it's yeah. It's. I think it's become a bit of a running joke that whatever uh, episodes they say are next end up uh, being railroaded somewhere else. But I'm pretty confident that the next two episodes are pretty much set in stone. Yes. So yeah. So we have uh, the next episode will be a um, look at the uh, latest update for No Man's Sky, the Beyond update. That's not an RPG. Sure it is. It's doing stuff it doesn't have turn-based <laughs> combat like yakuza does now but <laughs> you're playing a role as an astronaut and stuff we we do um, we do what we want over here so that's right <laughs> so so john it'll be john jordan and i and we uh, may have a fourth guest to if if we can pull him away from his job he can roll, so yeah. we'll see that's johnny we'll right johnny, goes. jonathan johnny metz was uh yeah, we were he's playing. We know he's that. playing the game. Yes, yeah, yes. we're we're trying to convince him to to join us. That'd so, uh, yeah. yeah, we're gonna. Uh, John and I have, are definitely like actively playing it, and Jordan's mm-hmm. gonna be joining us um, to do the multiplayer. And uh, yeah, I'll boot it up next week after PAX when I've got uh, a little bit yep. more free time. That'll be fun. So it'll I be try little, that game well, out. It's it's a fun game. Like it's. Uh, I mean, if I had to summarize it in a couple words, I'd call it uh, Space Minecraft. Uh, so yeah, so that's a fun time. And then the episode after that is I'm currently playing it now. It's my all time favorite game, Final Fantasy VIII. Yeah, um, careful, was... Zaga, David. There's a very uh, strict embargo on what you can say about yeah. the game. That's okay. Yeah. The the embargo will be over by the time this comes out. That's right. Yeah, oh, you know, yes. So yes. yeah. So like David's been in in like our Slack server saying for months that Final Fantasy VIII's the greatest game ever made. And I'm like, is it that great? And then like two days ago, he's like, oh, it has it has full surround sound support on Switch. And I'm like, yeah, it's that great. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was, it, I don't know if I would have noticed if you hadn't brought it up the other day because I was like sitting on my couch and I'm like, what is that noise coming out of the back of like behind me? And I'm like, my speakers are on. I don't know if I've ever had that's really That's really, that's really cool. Yeah. While I'm thinking of it, the surround sound support in Fire Emblem is really weird mm. because it's like reversed in the wrong channels. Like I actually think they made a mistake in making it. A character will be walking off to the left and there's sound of them walking away playing in the right surround <laughs> channel. <laughs> oh no. It's kind of messed up, but also <laughs> Kirby Star Allies just like literally has one waterfall in a world map and that's the only surround sound support it has. So, Nintendo, your, your, your surround sound support's really bad. Well, Nintendo's always been ten ten years behind on technology. Yeah, it sounds like it's on par with their online service. So <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Oh, uh, why don't you guys tell us uh, where everyone can find you? Uh, well, uh, you can find me on Twitter at Grimace Duminus. That is G R I 
G-R-I-M-A-C-E-D-U-M-I-N-A-C-E. That is like the McDonald's character Grimace, and it's like Dennis the Menace, but Grimace the Menace, but also Grimace the Menace doesn't fit in Twitter's character limits, so it's Grimace do Menace, D-U. Uh, I do a podcast with my longtime friend and uh, recent, recent, I say, as though it wasn't like a year ago, uh, member of NWR, Joe DeVader. Uh, we do a podcast called Smashterpieces, where we are playing one po- one game for every character in Super Smash Brothers Ultimate from 1984's Duck Hunt to 2007's Breath of the Wild. 2017's Breath of the Wild. Uh, it's quite a project playing 70 games in a podcast. So if you like Smash Brothers, if you like Nintendo history, if you like RPGs, we're going to play Final Fantasy VII in just a couple games. Uh, and Jordan's about to join us for Super Mario 64. Yeah, so, that's that kind of worked out well that we've got, Matt, we've got you on for uh, to talk about Fire Emblem, and I'm going to be joining you guys for uh, a dis- uh, little bit of discussion about Super Mario, uh, Super Mario 64 on Smash Up Pieces. That'll be a lot of fun. Yeah. So I don't I don't know what your turnaround I don't know when this episode is going to come out but right now it is August 29th and tomorrow I'm going to be playing Donkey Kong Country on on twitch.tv slash Nintendo World Report and then right after that Super Mario 64 and then right after that Final Fantasy 7 so if you like RPGs make sure you st- you check us out for that Final Fantasy 7 episode and we've got plenty more rpgs to come we we have an earthbound episode which you'll probably be very disappointed in because neither me nor joe liked it uh (laughs) in the future we have fire emblem episodes we'll have uh we'll have pokemon episodes in my heart of hearts i hope we'll have tales of symphonia but we probably won't so check us out we're at smashter pieces at uh anondino.com that is anon as in anonymous dino as in dinosaur dot squarespace dot com you can check us out at smashter pieces you can check out joe and peter spage's co- podcast original sound chat where they talk about video game music and you can check me out at twitter because i do some things now and then i'm kind of cool i like anime follow me on twitter if you want my opinions on jojo's bizarre adventure and fate stay night uh, so, uh, at, uh, you guys, you can find me at, at, uh, riskman64, R-A-S-K-M-A-N 64 on Twitter. Um, always sharing feelings about the games I've been playing. I just, uh, pl- did a few runs of, uh, R-Type, what the hell is it? R-Type, R-Type Dimensions EX? Yeah, that's, that's a pretty fun shooter game. Not always playing RPGs, but I am going to join David, uh, well, we're obviously going to be playing Final Fantasy, I'll be playing Final Fantasy 8 soon when it comes out next week. Um, I think next week's when the podcast is going to go up too. So we'll be we'll be yep. knee deep in uh, Final Fantasy VIII by then, and uh, playing some. Uh, uh, God, what the hell? David, no man's sky. No man's sky. <laughs> it's 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 been a long day for me too. Um, but yeah, looking forward to playing those games soon. And I'm going to be at PAX this weekend. So uh, I, I was thinking, David, maybe we'll have a little bonus episode somewhere next week as well if we can fit it in uh, where I uh, talk about some of the RPGs I played at PAX. Uh, we'll 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 sure. chat about that and see if we can make it happen because I know uh, you and Neil did something like that for E3. So yeah, yeah, no, that'd be fun. Great, cool. Yeah. And uh, you can find my personal Twitter at uh, filtered gamer and. Um, I'll have uh, the Final Fantasy VIII review will be on the site by the time this podcast comes out, mm. and um, yeah, so I'm I'm definitely not drunk because I usually drink beer with an alcohol content over wine, so it was only eight <laughs> percent right. tonight. So yeah, <laughs> when right. I'm in the single digits, I can I can drink a, as much as I want. I think I think Matt, Matt drank enough for the for the for the three of us. I would say. It tur- turns right. out my strategy of not liking beer and only drinking hard stuff was. Uh, unfortunate <laughs> but hey if if, well, I, if i can have more professional opportunities where i can just drink i think i'm doing okay. you came to the right place so <laughs> it's yeah. your it's your first episode you got to learn the hard i've That's literally right. never done a podcast while drinking alcohol before i had no idea what i was getting into <laughs> it's not gonna I, be the last matt <laughs> i think yeah. i held myself together you did a great job i hope and then the podcast's twitter account is uh, at uh, the thirsty mage all one all one word and uh you can find all three of us at nintendo world report so like i said there'll be a uh, final fantasy 8 review up there by the time you hear this uh you can check out matt's uh, article about byleth uh he'll also have the um uh, a video of uh intelligent systems uh coming out uh either before or shortly after this episode 
If that's and, not out uh, when you hear this episode, at me on Twitter. Tell me I'm a failure. <laughs> All right. Well, it was uh, great, great chat and fire emblem with uh, everyone. And I'm sure uh, before the end of the year, we'll have. When is Yakuza Seven supposed to come out? Uh, I don't uh, think that has a date yet. 2020 in the West, uh, January 2020 for Japan. So sometime next year. Okay. So, so I guess we'll we'll have to we'll have to play something before then to get us in the mood. Yeah, There's we could, like ten other Yakuza games. Yeah, we could play zero or one or or you know even the remasters when they show up uh, at some point too. Yeah, sounds great. Well, I want to thank you, gentlemen, for uh, we're back to the long the long form for this one. So. That's right. This is yeah. This is gonna be one of the longest ones, right? Just a, sh- yeah. a little bit less than Persona, maybe or. Yeah, well, Persona was four plus, so I don't think we're quite there yet. Insane. Also, among <laughs> among my friends, there is a uh, there is a phrase that is oft stated. Uh, it is in regards to how uh, the conversation on our Discord server in any given chat, any chat, will be overwhelmingly taken over by one subject that goes on for quite a while, and that phrase, y'all really like Fire Emblem. <laughs> certainly do yeah if if uh, you're listening and y'all like fire emblem you, i i hope you like this show because you got more fire emblem than you bargained for <laughs> yeah but, you know let I mean let us know what you think like especially uh if, if you guys have played fire emblem like which route which routes have you played you know which which ones are you planning to play like which characters did you like you know we'd love to hear from you guys so yep and feel yeah feel free to hit us up on twitter and if you like smash brothers and hate the fact that there are fire emblem characters in it leave me alone <laughs> oh, perfect. Well, thank you, gentlemen, for coming out, and we'll. Uh, thank you for having me. Thank you, and we'll, we'll make sure to get you on future shows. And we have to get that alcohol uh, tolerance up. So the more the merrier. All right. Well, thanks everyone for listening to the show, and we'll see everyone out at the next Thursday meet. Bye. Bye.